pre-conference workshop. Uh, and uh, we have a very interesting and useful topic, particularly in this time of the pandemic, uh, which is on development of electronic instructional material, uh, specifically focusing on uh, online learning. So uh, for today's uh, uh, session, we have uh, three experts uh, who are working at the cutting edge of information technology. They are uh, experts in both medical education and informatics. Uh, leading the team is Professor Rohan Amar Singer, who is the head of the Department of Medical Education at the University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Apart from medical education and staff development and training, uh, he was the former uh, director of staff development uh, at the university as well. He has many research interests, and these include ICT and innovative technology use in education and healthcare, including e-health, telehealth, and biomedical informatics. Then we have Dr. Pandula Siribadana, who is a senior lecturer in medical informatics and medical education at the PGIM. He has research interests in education technologies, ICT for development, public health information systems, and blended learning. Uh, Dr. Siribadana has been uh, part of the specialty board in biomedical informatics and medical education and has contributed towards establishing biomedical informatics as a specialty uh, in Sri Lanka. He has also contributed to many health information systems developments and implementations in the country. Through leading the Commonwealth Digital Health Awards, Dr. Siribadana has facilitated many new startups and innovators in digital health to launch their products and benefit from the global network of digital health experts. Dr. Roshan Hevapathirana is a senior lecturer in the Department of Anatomy, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. He is also a visiting lecturer and a member of the specialty board in biomedical informatics at the PGI. Uh, he has he brings uh, with him a lot of industry experience. Previously, he served as a senior software engineer in Lanka Software Foundation. He is currently a researcher in public health informatics open source and health systems, and has been involved in several international information systems projects in the capacity of a business analyst and information systems consultant, including for the UNICEF and for the Global Fund. So I cannot think of any other experts, particularly in the Sri Lankan context, who knows the Sri Lankan context well, and who can uh, you know, uh, uh, deliver this interactive workshop uh, and symposium in a way that will start from the basics and then lead towards the cutting edge in technology use for uh, instructional material development. So uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, warmly welcome the three uh, resource persons. Prof. Mara Singer, Dr. Pandula, and Dr. Roshan. And thank you for all who are participating in the workshop today. So hope you have a informative and interactive session. So over to you, Prof. Mara Singer. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Sela, uh, for inviting us to take part in this, uh, this event. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, for your kind introduction about three of us. And uh, we have quite a good number of participants uh, registered from various uh, departments. And uh, even though this um, meant for an interactive workshop, because of the increased number, we decided to do it as much as interactive, but uh, at the same time, uh, we might not be able to reach and ask you to introduce yourself and your background as a usual workshop because of the time limitation. And therefore, uh, I uh, 
even though I am not giving a chance for each and every one of you to talk uh, and do your introduction, uh, I really like if you can interact with using chat options and probably using uh, Google Docs. I don't know how many of you have familiar with the Google Docs and perhaps uh, some other uh, models. So we will use as much as possible interactive tools during this session as well. Uh, so that is the background. Now I'm going to show you my slides. I hope everybody can see. Yes, I hope everybody can see. Yes, sir. We can. All right. Good. Good. Thank you. So this goes as a uh, development of a, uh, instructional material, and uh, first we will look at the objectives of this session. My session. So if you, this picture shows you a fish in a fish bowl. If you do not have an idea. We are like a fish in a fish bowl. We do not know where to go. And therefore, in any educational system, we should be able to define outcomes of objects. So here, I try to define from your point of view, at the end of this session, learner, that is you, should be able to identify educational theories and instructional design principles related to online teaching. So that's the first objective you, you are going to make. And secondly, you should be able to describe the evolution of digital learning, how this digital learning is evolving, at what stage we are in. So only those aspects I will discuss with you. And after that, uh, Dr. Pandula will showcase how you can develop instructional material using simple techniques. And thereafter, uh, other session is uh, Dr. Roshan. He will basically introduce you with how to prepare videos. So that's how we expect to run this workshop in three hours. Okay. So, What is learning objectives? Can anyone tell me what the learning objective is? You can put into the chat box if you want, or you can uh, speak. Anyone would, would like to talk? No. All right, then I will introduce. Usually the learning objective has, uh, learning objective is a statement of what student or learner should be able to do. So simply as that. It has three components. One is a description and the, it includes act and the content and then the condition and the criteria. Usually the condition and criteria we are not putting in. However, uh, there's another link I can show Sometimes we are wondering what the outcome is. So outcome we show as a description, that's act and content and condition when you are taking them together. We call it as task. So from the task, we can develop the outcome. So it's a little hitch that there's a difference between objective and outcome. Just forget it, but we will try to identify what the condition and criteria is. So therefore, I'm going to show you the same uh, objective put in the condition and criteria. So what we have shown you earlier is identify education theories and instructional design principles related to online learning. But I have put condition and criteria. Uh, the term in this workshop is a condition. So if you can identify these theories, Within this workshop, that's a condition. So well, what's the criteria is? Criteria is all, all educational theories. It's not possible in this system, but we can put 
uh, all educational theory. So some of important, so that becomes a condition. Again, give a hint to the second one, describe the evolution of digital learning is the act and the content. In this workshop is the condition with 100% accuracy is the criterion. So, so that is how you can put the condition and criteria into the learning objectives to make it very specific. I, I'm sure you have heard the term like uh, smart objective. So that is how we can make it, okay? Right, I hope that is uh, uh, the basics. And then uh, you will need to know some elements like Bloom's taxonomy. What do you mean by Bloom's taxonomy? That is a model in three parts with overlapping domains. Cognitive domain is something to do with the brain. You know, in education, there are some related uh, names they are using, but it simply is sort of a thinking. An affective domain, affective is a feeling, attitudes and so on. And psychomotor, psychomotor means uh, skills. So sometimes uh, some people say three H's, which is first H is head, cognitive, affective is hand, and uh, sorry, psychomotor is hand, and affective is heart, head, hand, and heart motor. So whatever so, Blooms has explained that there are three overlapping domains. What's the important of this? The important is that you can select the action verb related to that, and you can uh, have a hierarchy for starting from knowledge, lower level, up until to synthesis and evaluation. So this slide is to show you not only cognitive domain, we use these terms from recall of data and synthesis and evaluation, but also in effective domain, there are steps, just awareness up until to internalization. In psychomotor, probably imitation up until to naturalization. So these are the equivalent steps in other domains as well. Uh, there's a, another, uh, aspect I want to bring is that in the modern modern uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the synthesis of creative has come to more than the evaluation. So you will also note that in some parts. Okay, then look, let's look at what are the educational theories and principles we are going to cover today. Probably we are going to talk about adult learning theories, not pedagogy, but endagogy. So adult learning theories, and just wait there. I will uh, show you, uh, I will show you uh, an exercise and while engaging that exercise, you will be able to quickly recognize whether you have a approach, adult learning approach or children's learning approach, okay? Just wait for that. And then uh, what type of learning theories we will, showcase uh, here start with behavioralism up until humanistic theories and then we will focus on Hobbes learning cycle and learning domains a little bit and then uh, different learning styles again I can give you exercise on that and then comes to the uh, principles related to instructional design so we will cover basically the ID model analysis design develop implement and evaluation model and camp model. And also there are interactive multimedia education technologies, web two and Moodle, probably I will touch upon. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the content we are going to uh, discuss today. Okay. If you have any question, you can ask. Uh, in the meantime, I will show you some of the new concept related collaborative learning, self learning and transformative learning, how we can bring about putting into making uh, interactive designs. Right, okay. I'm going to show you a diagram to show what is most effective, what the most effective learning method is when it comes to recalling, okay? So this uh, shows that after attending different, different learning methods, to what extent you can remember, okay? 
For instance, if you attend a lecture, only 5% uh, you will retain. If I allow you to read something, it doubles. If I use audiovisuals like this, it uh, becomes higher. And if I uh, demonstrate something, it is higher. But after that, it's called the teaming method. If I allow you to discuss uh, more than half, you should be able to remember. And if I allow you to practice by doing higher percentage, and if I ask you to use it immediately, you will remember most, or else if I ask you to teach. Okay. Now I need the participant response. Okay. So just give me an answer. So at the end of my session, who will remember most? Participants? Can you unmute and say? At the end of my session, who will remember most? No one. Come on now, we make, want to make it as interactive as possible. At the end of this session, who will remember most? Right? Yes, it's me, lecturer. Lecturer can, because lecturer teach. So, because therefore, lecturer can remember more. The funny thing is, the lecturer are being paid. So we are learning, we are being paid. So we have to change this when we are teaching. And therefore, encourage the learners to involve in group discussions, practice, and immediate use. That is very important interactive medias like this as well. All right. Okay. So therefore, we will try to make interaction as much as possible. How you can make interaction is by participating uh, in the chat box. I will invite you to put something on your chat box. Okay, what you have to do is I will uh, show you some statements, okay? If you belongs to option one, type one in the chat box. If you belongs to option two, type two in the chat box. Are you clear? That's a simple instruction. Okay, I hope you are clear. Now I am going to show you these options. There are five statements. Option one is, do you like to rely on teachers to decide what is important to be learned? As opposed to option two is, do you like to decide yourself what is important to be learned? Okay, just put in the chat box which option you are belongs to. Okay, some people two, some people one, okay, come on. The first group actually want to teach us to decide and the second group want yourself to decide. Okay, I will give another 30 seconds, okay. And you stop. Right, I have got uh, five and one and twos. Just keep it, remember, okay. Now shall we stop on that and go for the second one. Second option is, some people like to accept the information being presented in face value, as opposed to like to validate information. In other words, when I tell something, the first group will accept as it is, and the second group will say, no, I have learned it differently, so this may be. So which group you belongs to? Just put one and two. Just put one and two, and remember where you voted for. Thank you, there are a lot of twos, very good. And third one, some people expect learning to be useful in your long-term future as opposed to expect that your learning to be immediately useful. In other words, option one people will try to learn each and everything what the teacher says and will be useful in future. 
But option two, people know they will say, no, this won't be useful for me now. Therefore, I might not learn which group you belong to. If it is option one, just what for one, very good. And option two, what for two. And remember yourself. Okay. And the fourth one is also similar to that. Option one, people have little or no experience upon which to draw that is relatively blank state. As opposed to they have substantial knowledge. That means if I tell something, option one people, it's totally new. Option two people, they have some experience. Which group you belongs to, just put one or two and remember it. Very good. And the last one, some people have little ability to serve as a knowledgeable resource person to teach us and others. And option two people have a significant ability to serve as a knowledgeable resource persons and others. So option one people have a little ability, two has many abilities. Which group? Okay, I can see a lot of twos, okay. Right, thank you very much. Now I am going to show you, I ask you to remember which group you are belongs to. You don't need to showcase to others, just see which group you are belongs to, okay. So those who have chosen option one belongs to this group, children, and option two, adult, not anything else, but on learning characteristics, okay? Now you can see what is your predominant learning characteristics, whether you belong to child or adult. So of course, this is, uh, is taken from a research study done in countries like uh, uh, European country, there is a cultural difference on that when we are interpreting. However, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people in our country, especially uh, A-level students, they are coming to universities, they, they chose this child approach still. But we also have some elements. So therefore, there's a mix in this. This is important actually when we are preparing educational material. So that is the important thing. So therefore, uh, sometimes even though, uh, especially the second response, uh, uh, third response, third response, many of us actually like to learn anything that will be useful for future. That is our attitude as well, okay? So now we have shown that you, most of majority of you choose the adult learning theories. So therefore that's very good. That's how we planned our information. Why it is important is that uh, it is important because we are going to transfer, transformative learning theories. We are going to transform from one end to the other. Okay, so therefore this adult concept is important because they have ability to take responsibilities, especially in adult, on their own learning, okay? Right, then what is learning? We have been talking what the learning is. So what is learning? Can anyone uh, put in the chat box or speak on what the learning is? Yes, I'll give sort of two minutes for that what the learning is. You can unmute and speak as well. Come on, is that the first time I, anyone asked you to define the learning? If so, how long have you been learning? Yes, very good. Yes, I'm getting new information, skills and experience. Very good. A change in behavior, knowledge, attitude, or skill, wonderful. Yes, yes. I really like the term change. Yes. So change, so much so. So if you do not like to be changed, can you learn? So therefore, what's the ability of, as a learner to have? You should be, accept changes, yes. Okay, there are some other things, established changes in the life, change in behavior, a process of acquiring new knowledge. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. Now we stop it.
Now I am going to uh, give you another hint, okay? Okay, I'm going to uh, demonstrate an animal who is learning some tricks. Okay, just observe this. You see, hmm? there's a orangutan who is doing some work. Who taught? Any idea? Anyone? Who taught it? No one, yes, no one. Just imitating. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this... Uh, Skills of learning is not only peculiar to human beings. Animals do so. So what the skills they use is imitation. So imitation is very important part of our lives, especially who imitate most, adult, adult or children. Yes, children, they imitate. That's how they learn it. But when we are growing older, we forget that one. Okay. However, that is a primary skill, so imitation. Especially, uh, we use them when we are doing some training as well, okay? So imitation, so, so then what the learning is? Is that imitation only? No, I'm going to show you a description. That's a definition I, I like, not because of anything, but it's easy to explain it. Learning is an active, interactive self-aware process. Somebody said it's a process, yes, of course. That results in a meaningful, hmm? long-lasting, relatively long-lasting changes in either knowledge, skills, behavior, beliefs, attitudes, whatever. We can call them as a change in behavior that cannot be attributed to primary maturation. Of course, what's the point in maturation? Yeah, with maturation, you can acquire some skills because uh, when birds, you don't need to teach birds to fly because with maturation, they will catch it up. So learning is something before become mature and learn, you can learn it beforehand, systematic. So that's the important, that, that is how human being actually progresses than other animals because they can learn from ancestors. They need to, uh, they can learn from others' mistakes and then they can build them. So therefore learning has, uh, great impact on human being. We can discuss it later on. But the important thing is if uh, I said you only remember 5% uh, after my lecture, the 5% is labeled it as a different color. It's a process of change. If somebody asks what's the learning, it's a process of change. If you can remember that, that's enough. All right. So we will explore some of these things. I will skip these videos. Uh, then what's the teaching? Hmm? Teaching, I would like to call it as uh, you are helping someone to learn. Hmm? You are helping someone to learn. That's the teaching. All right. Right. Now this, uh, uh, I don't know whether you have access to web and you have a computer in, in front of you. If you have, uh, you can search. On this, otherwise I will straight go ahead because of the interest of the time. About what are the learning theories you know of? You can put into the chat box. What learning theories you know so far? I'll give one minute for that, yes? Just if you know, just put it there. Anyone know any learning theories so far? Behavioralism, very good. Very good. I'm sorry. Ghani's nine events, cognitivism, very good. Cognitive learning, okay. Thank you very much. So we'll stop because of the interest of time. Yes, there are a number of learning theories. We are not going to learn everything. But we can lay, group them. We can identify, group them into different groups. First is the behavioralism. Very early learning theories. You might heard that dog and salivation experiment, operant condition. So behavior stimulus and response. 
but with time people understood it is not only due to behavior but also something to do with your brain okay cognitivistic cognitivistic approach is like a computer you feed some information and then recall it kind of thing processing data processing and then people thought oh it's not only behavioral change but also not only even cognitive but also something to do with your need that is called the humanistic approach for for instance some of you actually here because not that uh, to change your behavior cognitive but you have some needs to fulfill why you have selected this course because uh, you have need to fulfill you need to learn or you need to use some technology so that's called humanistic approach and also the another interesting thing is uh, uh, important in our uh, our content is a construct piece you construct the learning together you construct with your peers you construct with your teachers sometimes and others knowledge is constructed constructed with other people connectivism there are other groups so likewise uh, we can group the learning theories into several categories actually this grouping on what basis uh, this grouping goes on when you group something and remember that's approach case called the cognitivistic approach likewise anything if you know these things you can uh, be very good uh, knowledgeable persons to decide what it is so so these are learning theories so you can read around these and mastering some few few learning theories will you will help enormously so that's what i can say okay so before going to next level do you have any question up until now seems like not okay thank you now i am going to give you another activity just think about this uh after this i will showcase one important another concept okay so this activity just to identify uh, uh, some steps we are taking when we are learn let's say learning to drive or you are driving i am sure that's the activity you are engaging in uh, all of you mostly so when you see something obstacle when you are driving what will you do do plan okay now i have to stop it or oh, i have to take this car away so that's called the planning and after planning you implement that plan okay after implementing you are driving taking to other path and then you are not continuing in that path isn't it you have to then you are re reflecting you are thinking whether i have done wrong thing or right thing if i have not done wrong thing then i will change it that's called reflection and after that uh, what will do you go for another plan so there are four steps involved here first you plan then you act it and then observe it what's going on and then reflect so this plan act observe and reflect is something which is inherent in ours so this is very much so in the learning so people have suggested this concept the concept is action learning cycle which is very important to understand reflective practice and so on so you plan something and then act on then observe and then reflect and then go for another plan and it continues so ladies and gentlemen that is how we go on our lives okay so what's the application of this application of this is in transformative learning when you want to transfer people you have to give them an exercise or activity or you have to ask them to plan and then act on that and then give them how to observe it and probably you can do third party observation and then ask them to reflect on and it will continue and in hops learning cycle so this is a bit of a complex i am going to simplify it it is related to previous as well so when you are sort of acting acting something and then you get the feeling and then observe it and then think that's a reflection so what hops does is basically he 
uh, experiment on on that and then he said when people learn there are four categories we can group in with uh, how they started their learning for instance some people like to do something and then get the feeling we call them accommodative type of people as opposed to some people like to observe somebody and learn and think and learn so they are assimilators likewise uh, uh, other other categories are also same however however when we are labeling uh, that even though it gives some idea how they have started their learning and continuing uh, there's another one i want to show you important in this is that uh, learning styles some people learn with visual aids some people learn by putting in a logical sequences some people will learn from uh, learning their own solitary some people want to learn effectively by discussing and social learning and some people learn best when they are engaged in some activities like physical and oral so you can actually judge yourself there's a small uh, questionnaire you can fill it uh, and then you can uh, sort of get to know what learning styles you are predominantly has so this questionnaire comes like here uh, instruction is basically to put 0 1 and 2 zero is there are 70 statements if the statements nothing like me zero up until statements very much like me so if you put uh, the statements so you will get this kind of graph so you can know what predominant style you are in and then you can decide uh, thereafter why i said decide thereafter because some people say there's no use on studying this because uh, that critic is there but Or on the other hand, if you know what are the characteristics of, of your learner, are they are predominantly visual? Then you can put visual aids. If they are predominantly verbal, you can give verbal. And if they are pre predominantly physical activities kind of thing, you can give physical activities. So that's the use of these one. If anyone want this uh, memory learning style, just uh, email me. So I will give you this. Uh, questionnaire for you to analyze yourself okay right good uh do you have any question until up to now so we covered some education principles we group them into five main categories behavioristic cognitivistic and so on and then i introduce the action learning cycle how people learn and then based on that uh, hobbs learning cycle as well as uh, learning styles do you have any questions up until now before we are going to introduce instructional design models you can put in the chat or you can speak no question you have either understood fully or you have understood nothing i wait one minute and proceed so this is also important when when we are teaching to students we need to give enough time for them to come up with then question or answer so another 30 seconds seems like nobody is asking questions that means uh, yes thank you very much it's clear okay so therefore i will proceed right then we are i am going to introduce a little bit of a instructional theory model first is the adi model adi is the uh, that is also useful model so that goes like this you first analyze analyze what kind of learner what kind of technology what kind of content they need and then go for a designing you design your instructional material you design your instructional method and then after design you can develop it for instance uh, uh, now uh, next sessions you will have some chance to develop that 
and in the and after that you can implement and after implementing you evaluate its very simple steps that is called the ADE model that's a frequently used model in uh, uh, in educational area also uh, there's another model called KEMP model KEMP model is also have above elements but more precisely nine core elements so I'm going to rush it because these things you can access on the internet. I'm going to introduce it today. Uh, you can identify. Uh, so these uh, nine steps uh, include setting up a specific goals, the naive characteristics. Those are compatible with the uh, ADI model analysis. Then clarify, hmm, clarify, then define what it is. That's called the designing and use the structure it also in design part. And what instructional strategy is used? Again, design part. And the instructional message, how you put the message, that is the uh, implementation, and then evaluation, and uh, then appropriate resources that support, that's a feedback, okay? So you can see uh, it's a bit of expansion, but uh, one important thing in the D model is that uh, it's a cir circular one. So you can go on a circle and get some uh, other elements like uh, format evaluation, ma uh, project management aspects, so you can include many aspects if you are going on chem model, all right? So those are two models we usually used. And the other one is uh, you need, the concept you need to understand is the communities of practices. There are online learning communities, and uh, they are practicing. A good example these days uh, are blog sites. Hmm? Even in Wikipedia, hmm? people are learning from that. Likewise, there are uh, online communities. Some, some precise communities are also there. If you are accessing BMJ, there are BMJ groups. Uh, they are acting together. Even in ResearchKit, you can make learning communities. So, so that is the another idea attached to the instructional design. All right. Okay. So I have planned some activities, but uh, with the interest of time, I cannot continue. However, you can access this later. And the other concept I want to introduce is a web one and web two and about technologies. What is web one technology? Web one technology is something we develop like a textbook, we publish it. We publish it, that's that. But from web two onwards, this interactivity comes. Social media comes because the learner also, the reader also can contribute to the material like blog sites, like Wikipedia, even YouTube. So those are the second era. Likewise, until up to web five and even seven. So you can see here how the web of content comes in these early years. And after that, we call the web of communication because internet comes into play and the communication is started. And then uh, comes to web of connectivity. And uh, now up until recently, web of things. And then it goes to web of thoughts like uh, artificial intelligence and so on, okay? So this is how, ladies and gentlemen, the world is moving with IT technologies, uh, really speaking, these uh, technologies has not directly developed for education. They have developed for businesses, communication and entertainment purposes, but we can use it. That's our creativity. You can use some of these technologies for educational excellence. So that's the idea I want to give by showing this slide. And virtual world, Experiment. This is a picture from University of Queensland where I learned uh, virtual world realities. That's called the second life. Like here, you can make your avatar and go to there's a teacher. Teacher also participates, give some virtual experience, virtual learning experience. So that is uh, to that to happen. We have to have good broadband and connectivity and so on. So there, there are limitations, but there are. Uh, good advantage. So this is a simple classification I can give you uh, to sort of uh, classify learning softwares. 
So there are common softwares like web browsing, communicating tools, web processing, calculating, presenting, graphic media tools, we can use in order to teach. For instance, now uh, Dr. Pandul will show you how to make presentations tool for education. And then uh, Dr. Roshan will show how to use graphics and multimedia for education. And there are a specific software, we call the learning management systems. They are designed for learning purposes. Uh, also, they are in two kinds. One is open source, the other one is a commercial uh, open source. Is source code is open, and which is we frequently use Moodle platform, uh, which gives a specific user. So, so this is a simple specification I can give you how this learning software is. Okay. And uh, just to show you, there's an interplay between uh, medicine or health with education and ICT. So there are terminologies I will introduce you. When it comes to medicine and education, we call the medical education or health education that we all are engaged in. And when we combine education and ICT, we call the e-learning. Of course, e-learning is a change in concept. Now we call the digital learning. You know how these terms come? Initially, there is a computer introduced and people thought, okay, we can use computer to assist learning. And therefore the CAL, computer assisted learning terminology comes very early years. And after that, people thought we can use all the uh, material to deliver through the computer because uh, we can ask them to read like a textbook, we can ask them to watch like a movie, we can ask them to type like a textbook, a writing book. So likewise, we can use all the modalities of learning through or solely through the computer. Computer-based learning, CBT terminology comes. And after that, the thing happen is uh, computers start calling with each other, connecting with each other. We call the networking. Once the networking done, it comes the worldwide web, web-based learning or online learning. That's how it comes. After that, people realize this online learning, web-based learning, uh, we can group into e-learning, electronic modalities, e-learning, okay, that is term we are using. However, then people thought, okay, there's another terminology we can use, a uh, digital learning. Now, this is a digital era we are going on. So, some people call digital learning. Whatever so, that's a use of ICT merging with education. Uh, there's another terminology, with, you can combine this ICT to medical and education practice, we call the telemedicine no, in, medical informatics uh, that some of our experts are uh, experts in, okay? So the model I presented in last year, 2019, uh, is that ICT will form a basic uh, sort of infrastructure for you to educate as well as practice in health. Now with COVID, you have uh, now uh, sort of experienced that, experienced that uh, with the COVID. I don't want to explain much more now. Okay, so what I can show is there's an evolution of learning occurs. Very good old days, there's a one-to-one -one teaching. Hmm? Especially in medicine, it's a one-to-one -one teaching. And with the establishment of schools and universities and systematized, there's a one-to-many teaching. One teacher teach many students. Now what? We have MOOCs, uh, massive online open source courses, you might familiar with the course and others. So there are many people will teach one student or many students. No need to say this, it has become very complex now. Very complex, becoming very complex because the learner can learn from various resources and evaluators and uh, judges who are making grading, rating has an immense uh, uh, challenge because of this, okay? I will introduce uh, another concept called transformative learning. Transformative, as I explained earlier, is you transform from one to the other. You can see here the action learning cycle comes, planning of actions and then practice, get the experience and then reflection. Reflection is very important and develop theories. So like, therefore you can transform, okay? And if you want to read, uh, there are book chapters I have written, how to apply these transformative learning theories in teaching and how to foster self-regulation. So these are references. 
with that i would some like to summarize my small talk today so uh, just check whether you have achieved this and that is what i want to achieve okay at the end of this session were you able to identify educational theories and instructional design principles related to online learning say yes in the chat if it is yes say no in the chat if it is not that's a feedback i need now Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm getting yes. Okay. If not, okay, I will not be happy. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, just to stop it. And then uh, second one. Second one is, have you get, uh, are you able to describe somebody how this digital learning evolved? How this digital learning evolved? Have you got some idea? Say yes if it is yes. Say no if it is not. Yes, I'm getting yes responses. I haven't seen any no. Thank you very much for your courtesy. <laughs> okay. So so that's the end of my presentation. So now I hope now you have some idea about educational theories, instructional design principles. And also you have understood how this everything evolved. So therefore we are ready now to move on to next sessions, which involves how to utilize these uh, theories and principles when we are developing material. So with that, uh, I would like to wish all the best uh, for you as well as the conference organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rohana. Uh, uh, I believe uh, our next speaker, uh, and who will continue uh, basically, uh, you know, building on the foundation that uh, Prof. Mara Singh provided uh, about the concepts behind instructional material development. Uh, uh, Dr. Roshan or uh, Dr. Pandula? Dr. Roshan Hewa Patirana, Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, uh, will be uh, building on uh, the discussion and uh, taking this uh, workshop and the symposium forward. Thank you very much, Roshan. Thank you, Professor. Okay, uh, now I will uh, start uh, uh, a small session on uh, a bit of a technical aspects uh, uh, of uh, uh, the instructional video material production uh, because now Prof. Uh, uh, Mar Singh uh, highlighted the different educational uh, principles and uh, he brought uh, this uh, concept of uh, uh, the web two uh, where uh, the material can be shared uh, across different uh, uh, learners. And uh, then uh, 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 also mentioned about this learning management system. So uh, uh, I guess uh, Adam Pandula will be doing more on learning management systems uh, itself. But uh, uh, now uh, to go, I mean, uh, the video is one of the uh, key material uh, uh, you can uh, upload uh, to the learning management system um, uh, along with uh, 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 the other uh, materials like PDF and uh, uh, the PowerPoint slides. So uh, we especially uh, as again, uh, Prasman Singh mentioned uh, with this uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, everything, uh, uh, the entire uh, learning uh, sphere disrupted. So a lot of uh, online uh, uh, presence came in. Uh, so that's where uh, this educational video uh, also uh, uh, 
made a huge uh, uh, entry into this uh, uh, arena. So uh, in this uh, session, I would like to bring your notice uh, or, or bring your attention uh, to uh, uh, what are the different types of instructional video uh, uh, currently uh, uh, available or what are the different practices uh, use, uh, of uh, uh, creating online videos. And then, um, um, in very brief, how you plan and create a uh, instructional video material, and uh, uh, then I will be showing you two uh, approaches where you can uh, uh, create online video material. One is uh, uh, using this uh, online platform uh, platform such as YouTube uh, YouTube Studio. And the other one uh, is online video editing, uh, offline video editing tool where you can install on your computer. Uh, um, I'm using this uh, open source tool, which is freely available, uh, which is called OpenShot, but I will be uh, giving you a, a background of different uh, tools available, commercial uh, uh, as well as uh, the free tools. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll be showing you how to upload uh, uh, this uh, the two two kind of materials uh, to the uh, Moodle uh, learning uh, system uh, with uh, some of these uh, uh, available approaches on uh, learning uh, the Moodle platform. So uh, to start with, uh, now there are uh, different. Uh, um, concepts and educational principle of uh, influence uh, the production of learning uh, um, video learning materials also. Um, so um, basically uh, there are uh, about five, six different categories of uh, instructional video materials. Uh, so to start with uh, the one uh, or the shortest uh, out of these would be uh, this micro videos. Micro videos is uh, I mean, perhaps uh, comparable to this, uh, the micro lectures. Uh, uh, this is a, a very short video materials uh, on a very specific uh, uh, subject. So uh, in micro videos, basically only one um, message uh, will be uh, conveyed to uh, the audience. Um, and um, so as this says, it's, uh, it's a short, uh, instructional video that focus on teaching a single narrow topic and the time span is uh, maybe uh, one or two minutes like and uh, so from that there are uh, uh, more lengthier uh, video uh, materials so the next would be uh, the tutorials tutorials uh, are teaching uh, a process or walking through the steps need to complete a task usually between uh, maybe up to about 15 minutes uh, long and uh, we can add some interactive elements also for example um, uh, tutorial is uh, maybe even uh, um, i think if you are uh, looking into uh, i mean uh, accessing the youtube video there are a lot of uh, uh, home cooking videos so that kind of things are basically tutorial so um, again uh, with uh, the tutorial focus on uh, few concepts, for example, uh, uh, a recipe and how that can be converted into a delicious meal. Uh, so, um, uh, and this is actually uh, focusing on uh, uh, a process uh, where everyone can uh, follow the tutorial and redo uh, uh, the process uh, which uh, is being introduced by uh, the presenter. And then uh, there are more lengthier uh, and uh, kind of a more formal uh, approaches uh, called training videos. The training videos, uh, as this uh, uh, description explains, are designed to improve workplace skills and commonly cover interpersonal topics or job related topics. Many users, multiple instructional techniques and interactive elements. So unlike tutorials, training video often uh, use uh, footage of real people to help boost the connection between training and uh, trainer and uh, training. Uh, so um, here basically, for example, uh, let's say uh, if we are adding a, 
video or to a medical students uh, on uh, 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 maybe communication skills uh, kind of thing and how to take histories, uh, how to do examinations, perhaps that, that those comes in this training video uh, uh, category where um, we can, uh, we basically uh, go uh, and do the recording uh, in the word setup or with uh, the actor, uh, but we simulate the environment and the work practices. A tutorial video, for example, we can say, okay, uh, vena puncture and uh, that kind of, uh, the measuring blood pressure, that kind of very specific uh, um, aspects. And uh, here as well, in both the tutorial video, as well as the training video, we can add interactivities, um, depending on like, for example, um, we can uh, uh, ask questions uh, and um, we can add uh, uh, a small um, kind of a, a simple uh, quiz kind of a thing uh, in the text format. Uh, and there are uh, more interactive uh, technical approaches also but uh, uh, I mean, uh, even uh, on, onto a video, we can add some of the simple, um, uh, simple uh, quiz kind of a things also. So uh, those are actually uh, the micro video, tutorial video and training video. Basically, um, we had to plan it and do the recording. Uh, it's a kind of, again, uh, um, um uh, training video would be more formal but uh, in in other two also we need some of the preparation and uh, uh recording and uh, compared to that uh, we have different other um approaches also like i think this uh, screenshot i have shared uh, uh, recently um uh, got a lot of attention on uh, this particular uh, youtuber and the gamer um uh, so uh, this uh, concept is called screen uh, screen screen casting. So uh, they are screen uh, recording uh, designed to teach. Uh, I mean, um, uh, they do something on um, uh, their digital platform, maybe on mobile, maybe on uh, uh, the desktop or laptop, and they real time cast that to uh, different uh, uh, social media like uh, YouTube uh, streaming or Facebook streaming. And uh, so this is actually a technique uh, which was, uh, um, I mean, hugely popular among these uh, online gamers. Uh, so um, there are different games uh, uh, they uh, frequently uh, uh, use, like the Euro Truck Simulator and uh, PUBG kind of a game. And uh, if you uh, uh, check uh, Facebook and uh, maybe YouTube, you can see how many followers, I mean, thousands and thousands of followers uh, actually waiting for their uh, uh, performs and uh, interacting with them. So that is one uh, one um, um, one reason why I showed this was actually uh, uh, this online presence um, um, is a very powerful tool. Um, I guess we are not uh, utilizing it in the full scale uh, in the education, uh, uh, but there are different people who are very uh, entrepreneurial manner using those uh, um, concepts and they, they really um, earn um, a considerable amount uh, uh, through this uh, platform. So that's where actually uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook and uh, all the other social media uh, uh, firms basically putting a lot of money to perfect this platform. So this is the way we have a good opportunity to use uh, these uh, uh, platforms uh, in educational aspects also. So um, screen sharing, uh, the screen casting, basically you can use if you wanted to uh, uh, um, maybe um, show something and doing, uh, uh, um, doing something and even um, you um, can do, uh, use the screen casting uh, to show, uh, I mean, uh, record a, uh, the lecture on your computer uh, and uh, upload it to uh, YouTube or uh, the LMS kind of uh, setup. And uh, 
there's another like other than the screencasting uh, you can even go for a presentation and lecture capture in a more formal uh, way also so they, that that would be the recording a lecture or presentation to make available for online audience uh, which could be again simple recording of the audio um, and uh, maybe embedding this audio uh, to a, a, a powerpoint kind of a presentation uh, slide sets and uh, or else, uh, I, I think uh, some universities uh, now moving into that uh, um, uh, level as well. They, they 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 are in the process of creating. Uh, even some school did uh, uh, recently with this uh, uh, pandemic setting. They they were uh, creating some uh, uh, multimedia laboratory kind of a. Uh, spaces with the interactive or uh, conventional whiteboard kind of a blackboard and uh, uh, fixed cameras and microphones they actually uh, record the video and uh, stream or um, uh, uh, make them a reusable video so that those are um, another i mean that, that would be the uh, more professional um, or more uh, formal uh, way of uh, creating this presentation uh, um, and uh, making uh, those available on online so basically uh, uh, in our uh, practices uh, converting a video uh, converting a slide set into a video with the voice maybe screencast uh, approach would be uh, a simple uh, enough you can use uh, even the tools like uh, zoom to do this i will uh, share another slide on how to do and uh, share a link as well uh, how you can use the zoom platform to record your own video with your um, uh, picture appearing um, as well as um, uh, voice over the video and uh, or else you can use uh, um, even uh, the webcam or um, other uh, camera setup uh, and uh, again, combine uh, the presentation uh, with the uh, uh, the camera uh, feedback as well. So uh, with uh, the use of uh, uh, video editing tools, which again uh, I will very briefly touch upon in this uh, presentation. So uh, here, uh, um, if you are uh, trying to create a video. Uh, even a simple uh, 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 formal educational uh, video, I think there are a few steps uh, you have to follow. I mean, it's a better uh, always to follow uh, in that way uh, so that uh, then you will be uh, able to um, effectively uh, employ these educational concepts as well as uh, um, convey your message very clearly and uh, then. Uh, uh, perhaps add some interactivity uh, into the uh, video uh, and make it more professional. So the four steps would be uh, 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 formulating a script and uh, recording your video and editing uh, your video material and um, hosting it uh, in uh, whatever the platform uh, you would like to host. So if you take uh, this one by one, uh, screenwriting uh, in very simple way. What you can do is, uh, okay, you can time it. Uh, maybe it's uh, thirty minutes, uh, forty-five minutes, uh, and uh, even it's a one hour. You may perhaps you uh, may think of doing it two small parts, so you exactly know at which point you stop and then uh, start uh, the, uh, uh, the second part of the video because uh, now this timing uh, has to uh, uh, fold importance uh, primarily uh, because uh, one is this educational uh, uh, background of it, attention span and um, uh, how long, uh, especially adult learners will keep their attention on uh, a particular material and uh, the other aspect of it is uh, when you are converting that to digital media uh, the size of this uh, material so sometimes there will be restrictions on lms and i will be finding it difficult to upload to the youtube if it is a huge size so that's the other aspect why you need to plan your um, recording so basically uh, uh, video scripts uh, needs uh, um, 
um, the uh, the concept you are going to focus and the time duration um, and any breaks and also um, you can uh, very simply write down even for your personal uh, video material production you you may be able to uh, you should be able to uh, list out what are the other additional materials for example if you need to uh, show a simple diagram of explaining maybe anatomy maybe a, a medical uh, instrumenting kind of a process so um, you can list which uh, that kind of a, a pictures will come or the slides will come uh at what point of your video and then uh, um, uh, what is the uh, in, in in the video timeline where are the uh places where you appear uh, uh with your uh, video and where you shift it to uh, the instructional materials because uh, i mean if you can uh, combine uh, this presentation uh, with the, uh, your own video that will add uh, another uh, kind of a very personal touch to your video rather than um, um, learner watching a voiceover presentation kind of a situation. So uh, that would uh, perhaps add more interactivity uh, to your uh, presentation. So uh, that is basically uh, uh, in very brief about this screen uh, writing or the script, uh, preparing your script. And then once you uh, have your script, uh, you can uh, um, uh, collect all the materials, uh, uh, even the devices, uh, the mic uh, you may need a microphone, you may need a camera, or else you can, you need to check uh, with the, uh, uh, the integrated camera of your laptop uh, is working uh, correctly. Um, and uh, so any other, uh, materials uh, like if you wanted to show a model and uh, project uh, some of these uh, uh, um, the images and uh, maybe uh, uh, for example if you wanted to show some patient clips of uh, images of a, a patient with a particular condition um, during the scripting stage you uh, will uh, may you may be able to um, uh, do all this uh, uh, fine tuning of those uh, videos and uh, images, whether uh, you uh, kind of uh, uh, take necessary uh, steps uh, to uh, uh, prevent the identity of uh, this particular individual uh, expose, uh, and you, you you should be able to rethink that as well because one, if especially the materials uh, uploaded to YouTube uh, can be shared across uh, the range of uh, users. So uh, when it comes to this medical um, education videos, it's very important if, if uh, um, patients are appearing whether uh, you took the proper consent and as well as um, uh, to take a, a proper measure uh, to uh, uh, to take necessary action uh, to prevent their uh, exposing their uh, individual uh, identities and uh, so with uh, after measuring all this you can move into this recording phase uh, so we are uh, you you based on your script you will be able to uh, do the recording of the maybe the video uh, you are appearing and maybe the presentation always like maybe the screen capture uh, itself. So presentation basically is uh, using, uh, you can use uh, Microsoft PowerPoint video, you can use uh, uh, your integrated camera or extra external camera and uh, screen capture. There are uh, several uh, device, I mean, uh, approaches uh, would be there at Microsoft PowerPoint. Uh, is allowing a uh, uh, lot of features such uh, as screen capture and uh, embedding uh, the audios. And there are uh, some commercial tools like Snaggy, Camtasia kind of a tool, but uh, uh, now everyone is using Zoom. So Zoom provides uh, another uh, uh, option uh, to do this uh, in a bit of a, a tricky manner. So I will show how to do that uh, if you're not familiar with that uh, because uh, 
uh, recording it on Zoom and uh, using uh, it as a, a pre-recorded uh, material would be uh, very easy and also because everyone uh, are now uh, familiar with the Zoom, that would be technically as well uh, very less challenging. And uh, then once you recorded the video and um, how uh, good you prepare your uh, script or the screen right, there could be some uh, places where, uh, when you uh, re revising the video, you wanted to uh, edit and uh, remove. Uh, for example, now in the beginning, there will be uh, 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 occasionally a uh, few screens where video uh, is appearing and then you try to uh, start uh, sharing your screen and that kind of things. So, so you would like to cut that part off and after uh, towards the end also uh, there will be few screens where you wanted to uh, i mean you are basically uh, stopping uh, the screen sharing and um, uh, stopping uh, your application uh, so um, your mouse is running all over uh, when you are doing kind of thing so uh, there you also uh, wanted to edit that but and maybe if you have done a mistake let's say it's a um, 30 minute recording and you find uh, you had done uh, uh, several at least one uh, mistake and you think okay uh, whether to redo the entire thing so uh, that takes another 30 minutes and what if you did uh, another mistake then? so that's where these editing tools uh, are coming handy so what you can do is like you can cut uh, that particular part uh, and remove that and uh, recompile the video into a single video or else you can modify the voice and so um, in the recorded video, unlike this uh, real time uh, streaming, you, have, uh, you can do a lot of uh, this kind of a, a video editing. And uh, even after uh, you have uh, recorded your video, if you, if you are thinking, okay, adding another picture or a diagram to a particular po uh, point, uh, if it is, uh, it would um, help uh, the users uh, um, to understand it more, uh, um, uh, I mean, um, easily. So that, that those kind of a things you can do with these uh, educational tools. So um, uh, the video editing tools. So there are uh, now uh, with uh, this uh, the modern uh, computerization and uh, uh, and especially uh, uh, this telepresence uh, and. Uh, remote uh, teaching learning context. There are a lot of tools um, um, have already uh, uh, reached uh, this sphere of uh, um, instructional, uh, digital instructional material production. So there are mobile app, uh, applications and uh, the tools you can uh, install uh, on your laptop or desktop computer. And even there are tools um, uh, you can do is editing without installing any uh, software on your mobile phone or laptop using uh, the online uh, editing platforms. And uh, once you uh, completed the editing as well, uh, th there you will have a uh, video, uh, your final video that, that is uh, uh, you have embedded uh, any um, additional supportive materials and you, uh, you have voice over it. Uh, uh, correctly and then any um, titles and any uh, text you have added so you have the final video and then uh, you wanted to share it with your audience so there uh, you will, uh, basically will have uh, uh, two options one is uh, uh, let's say your institution university uh, is having a learning management system platform you can straight away uh, upload in the particular places uh, perhaps uh, there could be modules uh, and uh, uh, lessons uh, already created uh, according to the timetable. So then uh, uh, all you have to do is uploading those into the uh, learning management system uh, platform. Or else uh, uh, now actually with the YouTube especially, uh, you can do it with the other platforms also like Facebook and everything, but uh, YouTube provides uh, 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 very uh, mature platform where you uh, you can 
share unlimited uh, uh, video materials, educational video materials on YouTube platform. Um, when uh, so uh, comparing uh, the YouTube with the other uh, that kind of a content sharing uh, platforms, YouTube has uh, an added advantage because uh, uh, the lifespan of a video uh, which has been uh, uploaded to YouTube uh, will be promoted uh, at least uh, a year or half duration. Uh, uh, compared to that, uh, any video you are uploading to the Facebook that don't uh, 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 won't be promoted more than uh, a couple of weeks uh, frequently it will be available uh, only for one week uh, because of uh, the, dif uh, the different business concepts and uh, different uh, um, social media philosophies uh, using the different platforms that's why now let's say uh, you are seeing uh, interesting video on youtube your youtube uh, uh, the facebook wall but uh, uh, if you are uh, looking for the same uh, video after uh, a week or so, you may not be able to find that and even very difficult to uh, search and find that video on uh, Facebook uh, platform. But uh, compared to that, YouTube, you can always, uh, even uh, the videos, uh, uh, I mean, so many years uh, uh, after as well, you can still search and it's a very stable uh, content sharing platform. Um, so compared to uh, the YouTube and LMS, uh, they are having their own advantages and disadvantages. So uh, I'll be uh, having another slide on that uh, in a couple of minutes after. Before uh, moving into this uh, YouTube and LMS comparison, I would just wanted to share this uh, um, screen uh, this about how to uh, use the zoom to pre-record a lecture so um, after this session i will uh, i will share this uh, particular url um, from where i uh, there's a nice uh, pdf uh, on this uh, pdf tutorial very short one i will share that and so you can download and uh, go through this very uh, detailed description but uh, in uh, uh, as a in very briefly what you can do is you can schedule a meeting on Zoom platform uh, and um, uh, you have to prepare uh, your slide set and any other material you wanted to uh, screencast during this uh, uh, session. And uh, then you, uh, you don't have to have uh, participants for this particular meeting. You start the meeting on your own and uh, then uh, you turn the camera. So if you wanted to see, uh, if you want, uh, you to appear uh, in uh, this, uh, I think now you can see uh, how it appears uh, with this, uh, um, this top right hand uh, side uh, video on screen uh, space here. So if you turn your uh, the camera on, uh, basically uh, you will be appearing at this top right hand corner and uh, in full screen, uh, you will have your um, presentation. And then uh, you will see uh, your um, Zoom uh, menu bar uh, also, and you can move it to any place uh, which is not overlapping your presentation. Even if uh, it is overlapping uh, after the recording, you won't see that menu bar there. Uh, and one other thing you can do is like if you wanted to use the pointer uh, during your presentation, you can uh, like uh, uh, shown here, uh, you can uh, turn on this annotation toolbar also, get this annotation toolbar, which uh, provides you to type any text and uh, um, I mean, use a mouse pointer, that kind of a feature also. And um, other than this Zoom, um, the Microsoft PowerPoint itself is having the pointer and this kind of annotating tool that also works uh, on Zoom platform if you, uh, when you are uh, doing this uh, uh, recording. Basically, uh, uh, before starting your, uh, the presentation, you had to uh, start the recording. Uh, you, you had to uh, click this record button and start me, uh, the recording the meeting. And after that, you can uh, 
like uh, st uh, start sharing the presentation and continue the presentation as uh, you are doing it uh, for audience. Uh, so after you complete the presentation, what you have to do is uh, you have to uh, stop the screen sharing and then uh, stop the uh, meeting. And once you stop the meeting, make sure and uh, then uh, as soon as you stop the meeting, uh, uh, Zoom will uh, pop up a, uh, another uh, dialog box and uh, it will inform you that Zoom is ready to uh, record the uh, session and let it record and uh, just uh, note where it is going, whether it's a Zoom folder or any other folder you have given previously. And uh, with that, basically, um, uh, you can have a uh, pre-recorded uh, lecture using the Zoom platform. So uh, uh, I think uh, after referring to uh, this, uh, uh, the PDF uh, I have just mentioned, you'll be able to do it uh, if you are not doing that uh, uh, at the moment. This is a very easy way uh, to do uh, the screen recording with your photo itself uh, on Zoom platform itself. Okay, uh, having said that, so we can, uh, next we can look into uh, different uh, tools available um, to do this, um, the final edit to maybe uh, so YouTube recording and maybe you recorded it uh, uh, with your camera on the laptop and maybe it's a screencasting uh, of your, uh, on your laptop uh, with the presentation and um, you are appearing. So uh, there are different tools uh, uh, to do this uh, on um, uh, different platforms. So uh, now a lot of people are using the mobile tablets and mobile phones. So there are a lot of mobile tools as well. Uh, for example, Adobe Premiere Clip, uh, uh, Kind Master, Magisto, uh, Power Director, InShot, Peak, LabSelt. Those are uh, some of those, uh, like Adobe Premiere Clip, uh, those are commercial tools. Uh, but there are uh, tools uh, which uh, allows you to free, uh, use uh, most of the features freely, like uh, Power Director, uh, that kind of things uh, are there. And uh, then uh, uh, those are for uh, mobile uh, apps. Uh, now, if, if you are on uh, um, Apple platform, I think uh, you have this iMovie. Uh, so those are uh, on mobile uh, based uh, operating systems or mobile devices. And uh, if you uh, are planning to use uh, uh, the video editing uh, tools on your laptop or personal computer, so again, Adobe Premiere uh, is one of these uh, leading product uh, um, with the professional features. Um, so, but, but uh, the downside of it is it's a, a commercial and uh, so it's very costly. And Camtasia is another tool uh, and it's a, it has uh, most of the features uh, uh, Adobe uh, is offering. Uh, for this kind of educational video material production, uh, but it's a fairly, the interface is uh, very quickly learnable and fairly uh, easy to use uh, interface. But again, uh, it has its own uh, license uh, course and it's Power Direct Pinnacle Studio. Uh, Pinnacle Studio is, I think, uh, has some free uh, features available and uh, the open short, uh, shortcut, uh, kind of a things are open source uh, products where um, you can uh, access them freely and install, uh, download it freely and uh, install on your computer. So here uh, in this uh, session, so we are showing you this open shot, how uh, you can do basic editing um, using the open shot uh, tool. And uh, uh, there are uh, online tool uh, as well. Again, uh, Adobe uh, being a, company uh, which is uh, in that industry. So they are offering a uh, mobile tool, PC tool, as well as online tool, this Adobe Spark. And uh, ClipChamp uh, and YouTube is also offering uh, uh, online uh, platform. So where yeah, you can do um, editing online uh, after uploading to the YouTube uh, uh, platform. So we'll be showing that as well. 
and we video open open shot is also again uh, having a um, online uh, uh, portal as well so there are uh, different different tools so uh, up to now basically we uh, we were looking at what are the uh, different uh, um, practices of uh, uh, video uh, creation and what are the uh, four main uh, simplified steps of uh, producing education video material and we were looking at uh, uh, what are the uh, tools uh, available uh, or uh, uh, how you basically do this editing uh, after uh, you have recorded uh, 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 your uh, the presentation or video and then um, with that we can uh, now as i mentioned previously we have basically uh, in this education sphere we are practicing uh, uh, i mean there are basically two uh, media where we can store these uh, educational video materials one is the youtube Another one is our Moodle based. I think most of our faculties, uh, uh, teaching schools, um, we were having this le learning management system called Moodle. And I think uh, uh, you have already familiar with uh, the Moodle platform, uh, either as a te uh, teacher or as a student. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, uh, what are the limitations and what are the uh, advantages of these two platforms. Uh, and uh, in which occasion we uh, should use which platform that is. So uh, if I uh, start with this model, model uh, usually model uh, has to be uh, installed by your organization, uh, maybe your university or uh, your teaching school, um, and it is managed. Entirely managed by Moodle administrators. So, uh, and as uh, uh, we structure. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, yeah, I yes, think a momentarily yes, is disconnected. Uh, okay, I'll be back. Uh, I think uh, uh, what I was uh, mentioning was uh, basically uh, there are two uh, different uh, practices of this uh, uh, material upload. Uh, we have uh, the Moodle in our uh, institutional setup and uh, YouTube as a free tool. So Moodle platform basically, uh, as I just mentioned, um, uh, hosted by the institution So uh, and limited hardware capacity. So there could be limitations, uh, upload limitations of the Moodle. Uh, so um, for example, like 64 MBs, 100 MBs videos and uh, like um, 2 MB um, assignment limitation, that kind of limitations because uh, uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, content and uh, uh, our uh, the storage capacity is limited. So that's the main uh, limitation of uh, uh, the Moodle platform. Other than uh, the current model allows uh, video play, uh, inbuilt video playing facility also. Uh, um, the one uh, advantage of uploading uh, to the uh, Moodle is actually you can limit your video to a particular audience. It, it would be that uh, the, Students say it, and maybe um, uh, any other uh, um, uh, uh, audience uh, you have been uh, 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 enrolled into the Moodle platform, you can limit that uh, uh, access to the video. Um, so it uh, uh, 
so for example, if you are uploading a video of a patient examination kind of thing, it'll be more safer in the uh, Moodle environment than uploading to the YouTube. But compared to that, YouTube is providing you unlimited uh, um, uh, hosting capacity because it promotes uh, uh, very good uh, um, learning material on YouTube platform. And that's why uh, uh, YouTube allowing uh, monetizing of your material also, uh, if it is uh, uh, the content is originally from you, you can put ad and YouTube is paying you as well. Uh, so that kind of a things are there. And uh, because of that, YouTube is very strict about copyright. So I, I, um, I mean, uh, um, we are we all aware if, uh, uh, I mean, uh, when we are uh, creating the course, basically we are taking uh, YouTube videos and putting those in uh, model-based elements, but we can't do uh, that in YouTube itself uh, because YouTube basically um, uh, scrutinize all that kind of a uh, copyright violation. So if you copy someone else's video and maybe download and re-upload to your YouTube channel, YouTube will either ban your channel or uh, it will uh, disable that particular video if it is uh, uh, first few times. I mean, if you continue to do that, YouTube will ban your uh, entire channel. So that is very, I mean, YouTube is now very powerful uh, in that um, copyright uh, scrutiny uh, matter. They have a very effective algorithm, even in uh, real time streaming, YouTube can uh, basically uh, watch, especially like if you uh, are streaming, let's um, say, uh, songs kind of a thing, YouTube will uh, notify you that you are uh, playing a, a copyrighted track and it'll disable the audio so that uh, YouTube is actually well matured in that. So you have to be mindful copyright violation as well in YouTube uh, uh, sphere. And the downside of YouTube is it's not uh, very uh, easy for you to, you can of course uh, restrict the access, but then uh, it should be individual based. So you can't enroll a group of uh, students in your YouTube platform kind of thing. But when uh, most of the uh, most popular uh, access model is uh, the public mode, when you make it public, basically, um, you can select which age group, whether it's a, uh, under 18 or um, uh, unrestricted, uh, below, uh, I mean, uh, the child, um, unrestricted or above 18. Um, so if it is child, basically YouTube automatically, uh, if you uh, like family and child uh, setting where enable, YouTube uh, watching uh, uh, the comments and uh, ads uh, more closely, whether it's uh, uh, appropriate to family and uh, uh, child setting. Um, so uh, um, otherwise, like it cannot basically, Restrict, so uh, you have to be uh, very uh, um, mindful of uh, the material you are uploading. For example, uh, if you are conducting a session uh, in the uh, maybe your university uh, with the participation of external speakers, it's better always to get their uh, the consent of the external speakers whether they uh, they are okay with you are putting that uh, YouTube on uh, um, the the video on YouTube kind of a, uh, precautions because um, once you have uploaded the material that those will be tagged uh, with the different people and uh, they'll be uh, appearing in different uh, uh, people's uh, YouTube profile. And so that may uh, create some problems. So using, uh, you have to be always mind, mind, be mindful that YouTube is a public uh, media uh, public platform uh, and uh, access to your video. So uh, basically, uh, even though uh, YouTube is offering uh, an option in editing, uh, blurring the faces kind of a thing, uh, it's better not to upload any video uh, where patients are appearing and uh, that kind of a sensitive material, uh, even surgeries and cadavers, that kind of a things in uh, YouTube-based uh, media, even if you are maintaining educational channel, when you already your own educational channel on YouTube, um, basically uh, considering this ethical aspect of uh, this educational videos. So, with that, basically, uh, I would like to uh, give you a very brief outline of uh, the YouTube uh, uh, 
uh, studio that's uh, uh, the platform uh, youtube is offering uh, to uh, um, for you to upload your video and edit uh, um, do a, a fairly uh, good edit of your video material so uh, when you are logging into uh, the youtube platform um, if you click on your uh, profile icon uh, you will be uh, you can see uh, the youtube studio option also when you uh, go to youtube studio option always like you can type studio.youtube.com and where you will be taken to the youtube uh, studio uh, uh, portal where you can uh, upload the video in uh, two different ways one is uh, you can upload the pre-recorded video and uh, other one is actually youtube offering you to go live real time so you can actually uh, schedule uh, the go live so let's say you are having uh, some online uh, uh, session kind of a thing you can schedule when uh, it will be uh, um, um, you are planning to uh, go online with that session maybe uh, next monday morning kind of thing so you uh, google is having a, a countdown and uh, when uh, so when you are start uh, streaming live uh, YouTube will be showing uh, your video uh, uh, feed real time. And uh, then, uh, so uh, if you are uploading uh, a pre recorded video, basically Google, Google will uh, uh, upload it to their servers and then run this IP check and uh, age appropriate content check and everything. And it'll take uh, depending on your video length uh, about 50 minutes to 30 minutes uh, even more if it is longer uh, but after that uh, youtube will uh, authorize you to proceed with so you can add the title and any description um, and uh, that kind of things to the video and uh, the video will be uh, appearing uh, uh, in the your uh, channel and they are actually as uh, uh, i uh, have just shown here in this uh, right hand side uh, 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 the bottom screenshot uh, video could be kept private until you uh, uh, finalize the editing and uh, once it's been edit edited on the youtube platform it'll be seen as a draft so how you start editing is uh, it allows basic editing of the uh, uploaded video, basically uh, uh, uploaded video or else like even after you uh, went live, the, the live streaming will be again. Uh, now, you, if you see this uh, uh, right, uh, bottom right hand uh, screenshot, uh, you can see this upload uh, button in, in the blue uh, color and next to that the live or the live session recorded will be listed there and upload a session will be uh, listed in the uh, upload uploads uh, tab so both tabs you can uh, edit and cut pieces you don't want uh, to appear there and this is one of my uh, video from our faculty channel i took to show you this is one of these uh, variety show kind of a thing and uh, in your youtube studio as i shown in this left side uh, the editor button uh, will be there. Uh, you can click it and then it will be turning to red color. And uh, first you have to select the video you want to edit. And then uh, when you click the edit uh, uh, through the editor, you can see your, your video will be loaded with the preview like this. And uh, the video timeline will be shown, showing with the multiple uh, uh, screens. And uh, below that you can see uh, this audio uh, streaming is also there and two other uh, plus buttons. One uh, is a face blur and the custom blur. You can uh, even select areas where you can apply uh, the face uh, blurring of the faces or so, uh, adding custom blur uh, with a different uh, shape, any shape you want uh, uh, to hide parts of your video. Um, and uh, so, uh, with this interface, you can basically uh, do two uh, basic kinds of edit. One is uh, now you can see this trim uh, option. Uh, th that's an uh, option they are, they are, the YouTube is providing. Uh, so you can trim either uh, the beginning or the tail end of the video, or you can cut uh, pieces uh, at one by one uh, uh, from the uh, this uh, 
uh, uploaded video. So uh, in very uh, brief, uh, so uh, this is how basically you trim uh, maybe uh, at the beginning or at the end, uh, you have to um, first um, click the trim option, select the trim option, and then there'll be a blue box appearing uh, uh, as the second uh, uh, screenshot I have added. And then what you have to do is you have to move the, uh, this uh, cursor or the edge of the blue box uh, to the uh, place where you wanted to, uh, up to the place where you wanted to cut the video. And uh, then uh, after that, you can, uh, now you can see this, uh, um, the split option with the blue, small blue box is also appearing uh, when you are selecting. And then you can save the uh, video and then automatically uh, YouTube will cut that part. Uh, you don't want it to appear. Uh, and the streaming uh, uh, middle section will be a bit uh, tricky than uh, trimming a part of uh, the tail or the beginning. Uh, here, actually, what you uh, can uh, you have to do is again select the trim, and uh, you want to move the, uh, again the cursor uh, or the uh, this uh, indicator to the place you where you wanted to start uh, chopping off your video, and then uh, as a first. Uh, um, screen uh, shot here, uh, then split option will be activated. You have to click split and mark the uh, start of the uh, uh, chop off. And then uh, you have to uh, move that cursor to the uh, end of this part you wanted to remove. And again, uh, uh, click the split option. And then uh, So uh, then what you have to do is uh, either end of these uh, uh, two markings, you have to add to the other uh, end and that uh, will basically trim uh, the part you want. It will take some time uh, because YouTube again wanted to uh, recompile entire video. So uh, during that time, YouTube will be showing that uh, it's still working on. But after a few minutes, uh, your final video will be there. So if you wanted to cut again uh, from another place, after that, uh, you, you had to attend to that uh, uh, after one cut has been uh, done. So this is actually easy uh, in one way um, where you don't want it to, uh, uh, now let's say, especially uh, the videos where you live stream. Otherwise, you had to download entire live stream and do the editing and re-upload it. It's a lot of time. So that's uh, this option is basically for live 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 stream video where you can uh, remove the, the parts you don't want, uh, maybe copyrighted parts, uh, maybe other sensitive parts or any mistakes you have done on the live streams itself without uh, downloading and re-uploading. So I think uploading, if you are uploading a pre-recorded video, you can do that. Uh, uh, using uh, one of these uh, uh, tools, uh, we were discussing the offline tools or the mobile tools and uh, upload the final uh, version uh, to the YouTube itself. So this is basically uh, um, editing as, uh, already uh, a video already uploaded to the video, maybe a live stream or uh, any other video you have previously uploaded and still you wanted to uh, remove the parts of the video. And uh, YouTube is offering YouTube Studio app as well that also uh, providing different uh, options uh, for you to manage the uh, YouTube uh, stream. And then uh, I, uh, with the interest of time, I will basically very quickly go uh, show you uh, this uh, one of these offline editing uh, tool. I will again uh, share the download link of this tool so that, and also um, I will uh, select a, another YouTube video on how to do. This is a very simple uh, tool, uh, which is free as well. So you can do uh, some of this uh, video editing using uh, uh, this uh, tool, uh, which is called OpenShot. So OpenShot, if you download and install, you can, uh, I mean, there are a few uh, places you have to um, be familiar with uh, the one, uh, the number one basically is uh, the space uh, where all the materials you can uh, 
collect on two different projects. When when you are when you are starting uh, editing a video, it's called projects. You had to go to file menu and uh, select new projects, and uh, so that then you had to give a, a, spa, a place on your computer so that um, all the edits uh, and uh, uh, compiled video, um, the open shot will will be keeping at that particular location. So uh, you can have your pre-recorded videos. Um, maybe audio files uh, uh, where you wanted to voice over this video track and um, uh, even recorded PowerPoint and maybe images, you can collect to this space uh, under project files and all the project file will be uh, shown, uh, listed there. And uh, then uh, another um, concept, uh, if you are uh, if you, uh, wanted to be familiar with video editing is uh, uh, timeline and track. Timeline is basically uh, 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 the place where uh, this, uh, this is common uh, arrangement uh, to all the uh, most of these video editing tools is timeline and tracks uh, because timeline is uh, showing uh, the entire video project uh, uh, with the minutes um, uh, you are creating and uh, you uh, all the uh, materials you are taking to the timeline uh, are called tracks. So you, if you are having a, a, a basic, a basic video, you wanted to uh, cut into pieces. You are taking it to one track, maybe the first track, track one. And if you wanted to overlap a uh, image, you can create another, add another track, and uh, uh, you can, uh, you know exactly at what point that video should appear, uh, the um, image should appear. And you can add uh, that there. Yeah, if you wanted to overlap another video, basically a uh, small uh, piece of video, um, explanatory video, uh, you can cut the track. Uh, in this case, track one in the middle, and uh, uh, make some space and uh, insert the video. Or else, like if you uh, uh, continuing with the voiceover in the track one, and if you just wanted to show uh, the other piece of video, maybe uh, with a small uh, scaled uh, down in the side of the video that you can add another track and keep that uh, on top of your uh, video which is appearing uh, as a baseline video of your um, uh, editing tool so basically uh, you have to be familiar with this timeline concept and the track uh, multiple tracks are appearing and multiple material can go into tracks uh, base, uh, it, it could be video uh, it could be audio and even uh, uh, images and uh, so uh, there are different uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, is also possible that's called transitions and uh, also like if you wanted to add some text those are called uh, titles so you can see uh, from this uh, next to the file menu in the top left hand corner is edit menu and after that tile menu so i will show how to add tile, uh, uh, title as well. So title is basically uh, text which are which are appearing on top of videos. Uh, uh, I think you are familiar with subtitles of uh, this uh, the, the videos with foreign languages, and likewise that that's uh, again uh, one use of title. Uh, maybe uh, you wanted to introduce the speakers. Uh, uh, with their names and qualification and maybe you wanted to uh, space out different sections of the video so that's that's where yeah, the title uh, would be useful and uh, what i have uh, marked with the number three here is basically the uh, the tool set uh, uh, open shot is uh, offering this is a very uh, limited tool set but that is enough to do a basic uh, video editing and uh, this number four is basically uh, you can um, uh, it, it is indicating uh, in your video where are uh, where are you and which section is being previewed in uh, the space I have marked in five and number six is basically uh, the, the tool bar and uh, process to number six is uh, the tool. Uh, Uh, 
question. I think we are not hearing you clearly. Question is still the voice is not coming. Okay. I think we lost Dr. Roshan temporarily. We'll give a few minutes for him to log in again. Yes, Pandu, it seems that. Uh, yeah. yeah, the connection suddenly went. So during that time, my audience can uh, sort of uh, put any questions into the chat box. So later we should be able to answer these. I think Roshan is back. <laughs> okay, he's running now. Yes. Okay. Roshan, we can see you now. You're on mute. Yeah, I was just uh, explaining uh, this uh, tutorial section. We uh, are basically, uh, uh, it has embedded tutorial. So if you go to uh, the, uh, so a minute. if you go to uh, uh, the help and uh, uh, enable tutorial, it will be uh, uh, showing you different features uh, uh, in the uh, uh, the uh, uh, in uh, this open short platform and uh, um, uh, giving you a, a brief outline of what it is And then uh, uh, this is what I mentioned. Uh, uh, you had to uh, go to file and uh, uh, then uh, actually uh, trying a space to save all the material and uh, it will be uh, 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 continuing the saving and uh, final edits at that particular. Uh, Marcy, I think. Uh, yes, it seems like Roshan has come. Roshan again. No? Uh, right. Um, can, we, can we invite the participants? Uh, you can ask any questions if there are any uh, until I, Roshan joins in. Roshan, you are mute. Right? Yes, I I your connection is uh, having some issues. So time to time, sir, it's, uh, this uh, Zoom is resetting. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a high traffic oh, right. time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Continue. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was mentioning these three, three uh, uh, options. Uh, uh, you, you should be able to add a track uh, with this uh, green plus mark uh, um, shown here. And uh, uh, there's a scissor. 
that will indicate uh, that will give you option uh, to move the cursor to a uh, one particular point of video and if you click uh, 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 this cut uh, the scissor mark it will cut that piece and so you can move to uh, the end of this uh, the uh, section you order to cut and then you can press the uh, scissor again and remove the uh, 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 delete the part and then if you uh, like uh, when you are um, going through the entire video, if you wanted to uh, keep a bookmark kind of a thing, this green uh, triangle, inverted triangle kind of a uh, mark uh, will allow you to add some um, uh, markers on the track as well. So in this screenshot, uh, I have uh, shown you uh, there are uh, three tracks, tracks has been add, added, one base video and one uh, image and another uh, uh, star, uh, uh, this uh, orange star is again another image. So, uh, on top of uh, the base video, these two uh, other material are appearing. And uh, so, uh, and um, I think uh, you can uh, get an idea how exactly uh, you can do it uh, with the. Uh, uh, the YouTube video I'm sharing is about 10 minutes, a small video, but uh, will give a, a comprehensive uh, overview of uh, how to use this tool. And uh, there are uh, another options uh, like this transitions. Um, so transition uh, is basically allowing uh, when you are merging two videos, uh, you can put the transitions like uh, you can see uh, this kind of transitions in movies and uh, uh, in the uh, TVs uh, fading into one video and uh, maybe appearing more fancy transitions, but educational video materials, uh, it's customary to use uh, um, uh, less complicated uh, transitions. Um, and uh, then uh, the other, uh, the last thing I want to show you is uh, the title. So you can create your own title, uh, go to a title menu and select the title and it will uh, give you an option to create title. There are different uh, uh, title templates. So that's what you are seeing in the, uh, the larger screenshot, uh, right hand side of left hand side of the larger screenshot, different uh, title uh, templates are there. You can select the type, uh, title template. So in this case, I have selected this uh, standard one title template and you can put two, uh, uh, the, uh, one uh, text with the large, uh, larger uh, uh, font and the smaller font uh, under uh, below that. And if you type whatever you wanted to type on this uh, uh, space given, it will be a as a title. Perhaps, Roshan, you can stop your video yourself if the connectivity is a problem. And then you can save the title and drag the title to the timeline whenever you need it. And then, uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, okay. Um, basically, now this is the final step of uh, exporting your video. It's called exporting. Uh, if you click on that uh, red dot kind of uh, 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 icon, basically uh, it gives you very uh, user-friendly interface other, uh, rather than uh, this commercial tools. Uh, it asks few things, uh, a file name and folder path where to save your final video and a profile. The, uh, by means of profile, it, it is asking for which media you are creating uh, this uh, uh, video. Uh, so um, you can say it's mobile uh, kind of things, but in this case, you have to select web. And then out of the, uh, now it then after, when you select the web, it will give, uh, give you different web options. So uh, you can uh, um, create the videos to uh, Vimeo, YouTube, um, Instagram, whatever. So out of that, uh, YouTube is uh, preferred in the LMS and YouTube. So if you select YouTube under the video profile, it gives two options. One is uh, the regular size of 640 uh, to 480 uh, um, resolution. And uh, the other one is uh, 8, 845 to 480 wide screen. So um, usually what we are uploading to the LMS is 640, 480, uh, which is uh, good enough uh, on online uh, uh, delivery um, of these educational materials on both uh, YouTube as well as uh, the, uh, the Moodle platform. 
and then you have to you can again uh, fine tune it uh, for the quality low medium or high uh, if you have a lot of text and maybe fine structures like anatomical structures you can go for high but if it is uh, uh, very uh, like large font kind of thing you can select even the medium font uh, medium quality video so this uh, will uh, if you click on the export video this will basically uh, export um, without uh, i mean you don't have to be uh, knowing all these uh, technical things like which codec um, which encoding kind of a thing it will automatically select the matching one uh, after asking you these few questions so that's the other reason we selected this open shot because it's uh, make the video production a very simple uh, task and uh, so then uh, depending on whether it's a youtube uh, link or a, a, a pre uh, created video you you can upload that into lms uh, uh, into different uh, uh, manner so if it is a video basically you have to under the resource uh, of the uh, model environment you have to select file and you can drag the file uh, um, as per this uh, right hand side screenshot uh, in the model environment and if it is a youtube link if you upload your uh, video to the youtube and you wanted to uh, embed the link here to make uh, this entire process lightweight to the uh, learning management system you have to select what you have to select out of the resources is url and then uh, as i mentioned I indicated here you have to copy the url option uh, uh external url under the external url uh, of uh, this uh, url adding url interface so those are the basic uh, things uh, you wanted to cover in this setup maybe you can ask uh, uh, any question in the chat box and uh, and also i will be uh, uh, sharing uh, with you those links as well i just uh, mentioned uh, thank you thank you very much uh, roshan uh, since uh, we are in the interest of time we directly go to isl is here uh, Next thank you yes. thank you very much roshan and uh, so I think that was a very useful se session on video editing, uh, something uh, which is probably uh, uh, relatively new to many of you, but uh, has a lot of users. So uh, next we have Dr. Pandula Siribadana uh, to continue with the session today. And over to you, Pandula. Thanks, Asela. Um, hope uh, everyone can hear me. <clears throat> Am I clear like this or should I have a... Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I think I need to share in a different way so that the sounds can also be shared. Awesome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Pandula, we can. Right, okay. Um, now, um, uh, I think um, uh, in the previous two sessions, you got the background of uh, what uh, concepts or theories uh, is going to help us uh, in developing our instructional material and content. And uh, in, the, in Dr. Roshan's uh, session, um, we got an understanding as to how um, particularly video instructional material may be developed. And uh, that gives us um, uh, a, a, a way of um, uh, way of talking about the principles of multimedia instructions in little bit more detail. Uh, which uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Marasinghe started from the first session in relation to one of the commonest uh, instructional material that we produce, which is slide-based presentations. Um, whenever we do a you know, presentation or 
uh, a teaching activity, we tend to develop presentations, isn't it? Um, so therefore, it is vital for us to know what's best, uh, how best to utilize or how best to develop these material, adapting the principles that were talked about, as well as going into a little bit more detail. So it, this is kind of like a mixed session where I will use the PowerPoint both to uh, convey the message as well as to demonstrate how to develop it. So from time to time, I will go out from the presentation and go to the PowerPoint mode then show you the, uh, you know, the design of it. Um, and then we will skip back and forth. And as we go through, please do ask if it has any questions as you go through, we will try to answer these um, uh, with, uh, with time. Uh, but I will be quick in terms of doing uh, the basics because you already know most of the things that um, that uh, that related to PowerPoint because it's one of the commonest used softwares among us in developing a slideshow or a presentation. So let's have a look at this particular video first. And it kind of narrates why we are working so hard in terms of, you know, making our PowerPoints look or be more effective uh, to our audience. Let's have a look. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, electric cars. They're totally gay. It's true. I don't mean that they're homosexual gay, but I do mean your parents are the chaperone at the dance gay, right? You tuck it in and wear it real high gay. I don't want to disrespect anybody because I'm not about that, but I think we're understanding what we're trying to talk about here, right? I mean, honestly, the Nissan spit, really? It screams this. Oh, here we go. The Hyundai, pomegranate, right? The Chevy, fingerprint. Now, ah, oh, look at this. The 1966 Ford GT350. You wanna roll up in that one, Hoss? 1965 Pontiac GTO. Completely awesome. The 1970 Hemi Cuda took more virginities than Francis Albert Sinatra. What are we suggesting here? We're talking about taking the benefits of electric transportation, but combine them with the rock and rollness and the sexiness that the Dodge current muscle car models have. Nicholas, we believe we can produce the technology to incorporate an electronic motor in your current models. But with the aggressive sound character, the exhilarating vibration character, the complete visceral experience that we've all grown to know and love in the Dodge Challenger and Charger lines. Guys, we love our current electric models. That said, we also agree there's a market for what you're pitching. But if you're asking Dodge to invest in your pursuit of this concept, what do you have that we don't? Nick Brennan. Right. So now um, this is uh, this is not about a PowerPoint presentation as such, but this is a movie scene from um, a movie scene about a sales pitch made by a pair to uh, a week, uh, a, you know, a, a large scale motor company. They are going to pitch about their technology that they have, which is um, uh, electric engines. And they are going to pitch it to a company which has been making muscle cars or the cars that have character of you know, type of sports, sporty looking. Um, you know, uh, cars with a lot of noise, that type of cars. So now they are going to pitch this idea about the electric motor and the electric uh, uh, technology to this company. The, imagine that this is way back. This is based on a true story, but uh, maybe characters and all have changed. But during those days, 
if they come come here and describe their technology like this is how the electric motors work this is the technology these are batteries and the current flows from one end to the other then the engine you know uh, starts rotating and so on they might have not be successful in pitching their uh, point what they did instead of not to talk about the technology as a whole but they tried to talk about what this audience knew about about muscle cars about the uh, you know the sound character the you know the visceral character or the way the cars are felt when a driver inside and so on they looked at the need and they showed what their competitors competitors have been offering which is not really the muscle character that this particular company wants and then they said okay we can get the benefits of electric as well as maintain your muscle character in the cars that you already have and that attracted that audience so this goes on to show you that when you're making a presentation even to an audience in an educational setting there are certain things that we may not have to do in order to make that message perfect or message clear to the audience but then there may be certain other things that we could do that can make the audience attracted to that particular presentation as well as convey the message now in this particular scene the slides were only supplementary it just help the message to be taken across the speaker played a significant role and that is where the attention was drawn while the slides were providing support now this is again the same concept that we have to kind of consider when we develop educational material such as a narrated powerpoint video may i would say or even teaching live that the speaker plays a significant role and the slide need not to talk the same thing that the speaker talks and the slides will be something supplementary complementing the talk or the narration by the uh, speaker and this is what we are going to learn today in this particular session how the slide based presentations can be made um, more education friendly and fit the learning needs of individual participants now the learning outcomes there are four is to discuss why these principles are important multimedia principles will be the core of this particular uh, session but it is not going to be an in depth discussion of it but it will be an application of multimedia learning into actual designing of a powerpoint and we will then also look at the basics of powerpoint which also will develop get in you know show us the foundation of it right now i will exit from this presentation a little and go back to uh, go to powerpoint itself right can you see the desk, uh, can you see the powerpoint design mode now Not yet, Okay. What are you seeing? Is it a different screen now? It's uh, we are seeing you. Okay. I may have to share again. Uh -uh. Sharing has gone. Hold on. Now we can see. Yeah. Now we right. can see your desktop and now. Okay. I, I should have pressed the share button actually. So <laughs> I haven't pressed the share button. Okay. So when you use PowerPoint, now why I talk about PowerPoint is one of the commonest tools for everyone use, but this doesn't mean that's the only software available to develop a slide-based presentation, right? So it's just one example, uh, but uh, I will use it to demonstrate um, uh, this particular, you know, the concepts that we are talking about. Now, whenever you start off the PowerPoint, what you see is a blank slide, right? So you have a, you know, kind of a small thumbnail, thumbnail on your left side, Initially, it will be one, and there is a big working area in the middle. And if you go to the bottom, there will be another line that you can actually pull up 
and as you pull up you see that it says click to add notes and that is basically um, uh, an area a thing that we generally don't use but it's an in the, it's an added asset that we could use so these are the three key areas that we can work on in a powerpoint now you what you do these are things that you probably already know and you have already been doing uh, as we you know plan out our presentation say for instance if i am supposed to do uh, say half an hour presentation i will plan out okay what are the things that i will uh, uh, i'm going to cover during this particular half an hour um, i will look at the expectations from the session those are the learning outcomes the learning outcomes are the ones that we define how long i'm going to do this session what are the content areas i'm going to cover and how i'm going to cover this so it is based on the learning outcomes that we decide okay we can do a powerpoint based presentation to cover these outcomes right so what i'm saying is like if the outcome is say for instance building a, uh, building a clay pot or something the powerpoint presentation might not fulfill the entire learning outcome right it may demonstrate the way of doing but actual doing has to be done in a laboratory or in a work setting right so so there may be outcomes that you can achieve through a powerpoint and therefore you'll be choosing that particular method in a powerpoint presentation or any slide based presentation there is an end start and an end the start is where you put your titles your credentials maybe um, and and uh, a title that reflects the content that you are going to do right the secondary slide and the rest depends on the style of your presentation so different people tend to adopt different styles anyway how you add a new slide is easy basically it says a new slide there in the in the toolbar you just click on it and it, you get the second slide the click note that the the layout of the first slide which is the title slide and the layout of the second slide is different right because the powerpoint automatically decides okay now this is the second slide and this is second slide layout is to be different to the first slide this is made to enter a title the second one is meant to have a slide heading right so slide heading may be different to uh, the title the slide heading the first slide heading that in an educational content should be what the learners expected to achieve and therefore i might say okay learning outcomes because unless you state what is expected from the students they may not necessarily know what you are trying to achieve from this particular presentation so always best to start with the learning outcomes what the trainee or the student is expected to achieve at the end of this particular session you can match it with program outcomes as well like say for instance if there is a bigger you know much wider program outcome that you want to bring it in you can mention that and say this is part of that and then the trainings will be uh, the you know students will you know uh, you know place it position it properly in their you know mind map where this whole thing goes in once you define the learning outcome then you can actually present your content content will be in a logical order the you know the arrangement will be rational uh, the content will be just enough for the conveyance of the message and so on so these are the, the the principles that allows us to design good content is what we are going to discuss in detail at the end of the session you generally give a time to for a q a if you are doing a live session but otherwise you will generally end up with a summary and in the summary you will point out these were the things that we have discussed and this is the take home message now this is like the general structure of a, uh, a presentation that you would do however based on the style based on the content based on the participants or the event there may be changes but this content will somehow or other will be there and that is why going to guide you uh, in developing these slides now let me go into a slide set that is already been done this was the slide set that started doing all uh now in this slide you can see start is a title and the credentials of the speaker so that can be you uh when you are doing this right the 
before we start this is one of the instructional material as i said earlier that you very commonly develop right so therefore you know understanding the concepts is important um, um, for whatever that you do it may be a scientific presentation it may be a educational presentation or it may necessarily be something other than that as well because the powerpoint can be used um, so for so many other things then i actually started off with a video and uh, rather than starting off or saying the learning outcomes as well that is um, again a principle that you can adopt when you are doing live sessions or when you are doing a recorded session to motivate individuals regarding what exactly is going to be discussed um, during this particular session the video is one option you may not necessarily need a video all the time you might use uh, even an image right uh, image of uh, somebody uh, doing a presentation and maybe doing an erroneous type of a presentation that you can then narrate to because the speaker is important so image can speak thousand words also right so you can you could have used an image also in the live session somebody may decide on not necessarily having a slide or a image or a video but to talk to the students to say okay have you seen somebody doing a, a presentation which you considered boring or you didn't thought that it was done nicely that is again a way of getting into the participants making them motivate making them understand what they uh, what they are going to learn from today as well as to establish what they already know because then you can talk to the things that they have not yet known and therefore that will be more effective uh, however when you are doing this session at a distance meaning that if you are expected to develop instructional content a powerpoint and post it to the learning management system you won't be able to do that so therefore whatever you plan to do live face to face you may now have to incorporate to the instructional material in a different way and that's why a video may be an ideal thing because um, that talks itself and then you can add your narration at the end to say why this was uh, done the similar way that i basically explained why this video kind of you know gives a message out to the audience so this is a this is kind of a start and you can then see that um, i have put down the learning outcomes so that you will be clear what we are going to do today and uh, uh, depending on the time whether we be able to have you know achieve this or not it's different but if the if you are not there in particularly because you are making this uh, instructional material for online then it is more important for you to mention these because otherwise they will you know, the students will not have a chance to even ask you questions to clarify things so therefore it's important for us to mention what the learning outcomes that we are going to achieve right now we'll move on to the rest of the uh, for an overall view of the presentation itself as you can see now there are multiple thumbnails on this side so i have made this uh, presentation it consists of 19 slides little bit too much for my liking but um, because i will be going fast in some of the slides um, 19 probably we can manage generally the principle is that you will talk for about at least one or two minutes per slide so therefore that is the benchmark that you can use um, to decide how many slides you want to work with some slide you may not use that much of time but in some slide you may talk a lot more because i said that the slide is just the guide that will kind of help you communicate your message and therefore um, you might not uh, you may use more time than uh, what it is used to now then in between i have now used a breaker slide breaker slide is a slide that basically tells you okay now you are entering a second you know a particular section this kind of a slide slide is based on a multimedia principle also which we will be discussing later on but this may be useful for the uh, the listeners to i you know uh, understand okay now we are entering into a particular section of a uh, of the lecture which now changes focus so you basically jump from one section to the next in this instance um, after the initial intro i have put a breaker to say okay now we are going to discuss the multimedia 
principles okay we are preparing your participants and that you can do even during a live session okay now our whole discussion is about um, about uh, uh, making a powerpoint presentation using the principles of multimedia uh, multimedia learning now why we want to discuss this this picture explains now this particular slide you can see i have a picture uh, that I can move around. I have just inserted it here. And then there is a title, Importance of Applying Multimedia Learning Principles. But there's no text. Now you may be wondering, like, it would have been good to have an explainer to say what this is and so on. But I say it's not because I'm there to explain. And therefore I don't need any more text here. The image will speak as I narrate. And therefore, image is the guidance for the participants, while I will be the one who's explaining it. And that's the role of a speaker or a narrator, not necessarily to read what is on the slide, but is actually to explain, add to it, and give that input to the, um, to the participant. Why we do this is explained in this image. Now I'll get this image uh, full screen. Now, as you can see, when you look at the world, you have different inputs, right? You hear sounds, you see words, you see pictures, you smell and all those things um, are combined. Those are the, your senses. The, in, in terms of learning, um, while all these senses contribute, we take generally the inputs that are coming through our eyes and the ears, right? So through our eyes, we can see text, the words, as well as pictures, the diagrams and videos and so on. Through ears, we hear, right? Then we, the, the inputs that we gain through our sensory memory then moves into the working memory. Now, this is where there is a limitation. Our working memory cannot hold infinite amount of information. It's very short duration as well as it's very limited space. And therefore, whenever you get more information into it through ears or eyes or, you know, smell or whatever, tactile, that gets filled up. And as a result, if you input more information, it might overload that working memory. And therefore, it might not help the learner to achieve what was expected from that session. So as an instructional designer, we have to be mindful about this uh, cognitive overload principle. The working memory is our cognition and the overload of it will prevent us, prevent the, the participant from engaging in the expected level of, uh, you know, having an expected level of engagement. Now, Prof. Marasinghe said that at the very beginning, who learns best out uh, uh, at the end of the session? It actually is the lecturer because the person talking gets that stimulation of recalling, expressing, you know, using tactiles or whatever in terms of doing it. So he learns better than the participants themselves. We are going to turn it around and say, okay, uh, this is a learning activity for you and not necessarily for me. And therefore, we have to manage the working memory of the participants. So how you do this is by limiting or complementing the sensory inputs to our needs. We don't want to give too much information through the eyes alone. We can use the ears also. There is a theory that say that when you, when you receive uh, information from both modalities, it might be complementary than if you try to overload through one modality. For instance, if you have text as well as images that explains the same thing that I talk of, or if I am reading the same text that's in the um, slide, it will overload rather than help the learner because the learner gets the inputs, the same input from both modalities and get basically used up the working memory. And at the same time, if you imagine uh, a slide which is very crowded, very di difficult for the person to see where the text is and where the image is, that will add certain amount of uh, uh, capacity of uh, overload to the working memory because now the participant has to use or do certain things unexpected 
to identify where the words are, where the images are, where the you know the text are, and so on. That kind of extra things will also use up the working memory, and therefore we have to limit those as well. Same things can happen if you are doing the session in a you know humid, hot environment. Rather than persons trying to listen, they are now trying to think, okay, how to get rid of this humidity or how to get rid of the hotness. And therefore, that also work, use up the working memory, right? So that's why we adhere to these principles in order to manage the limited working memory that participants have and convey our message uh, clearly. So that is basically the requirement. Let's go into the principles per se. Now, this is... Uh, the first principle, which talks about the coherence of, of content. Humans learn best when extraneous distracting material is not included. Now, can anyone guess why I included this Greek, I think it's a god, why this image was put, why, how it relevant to the coherence principle? You may probably already have started thinking. Any ideas? Anyone? Why is that Greek god here? Any views? To distract, yes, exactly. So somebody will say, yes, it's to distract. So I don't know who this uh, Greek god is, but uh, this is a picture that I could find on the internet. I thought it looks nice. But what happens is with that, is that it distracts the participants. You probably have started thinking uh, how this you know, image relates to it. It may be a nice picture, you know, if somebody likes, you know, Greek mythology and so on, okay, they find, oh, this is that God that I read from the books and so on, start thinking about this. But it has no relevance to the coherence principle except to say this is extraneous distracting material. And this happens a lot in our slides that we develop, right? We tend to put flowers and, you know, bunnies and, you know, all sorts of things into our uh, slides for no apparent reason. And ultimately what happens is, that distracts the audience and it takes up the working memory that is precious for us, right? Then the signaling principle. The signaling principle basically says that we learn best if we have some sort of a clue as to what is important, right? And uh, this is exact. This is exactly what we were talking about. Now, uh, earlier when I showed you that there is a section break uh, between the introduction and the uh, multimedia theories, there was a slide saying uh, multimedia theories. So that's a signal to the participant to say, now we come to the theory or the principles, applying of the principles to the slide. Similarly, sometimes we highlight, sometimes we make it bold or sometimes change color of a particular point. And that's a signal that you can adapt. And using signaling principle, either in the form of highlights or either in the form of boxing or, or you know, arrows or whatever, will help learner to keep track of things as well as to I, you know, gather, uh, pay attention mainly um, and, and focus on that particular item. So that's that's the signaling principle. So you may have inadvertently used this, right? It's not that you did not use, but now you know why you have used it, right? It's a actually a multimedia principle that you can use. The redundancy principle. Now look at this slide, right? Now, this is about the gross domestic product in Sri Lanka and GDP in Sri Lanka is expected to reach 88 US billion US dollars by the end of 2021. According to trading economics global macro models and analyst expectations, in the long term, the Sri Lankan GDP is projected to trend to 97 billion in 2022, according to our econometric models. Now you watch the chart, you listen to me. Is that useful for you? Or could I have done something different? Anyone? 
use only the graph and explain no need to type the words yes exactly because that that probably would have been additional material or i have actually not used the whole multimedia you know facility to the best of uh, its potential right so i could have just had uh, had uh, uh, had the chart as uh, she suggested and probably have talked it over which would have had the same impact right or i could have had some points on the site uh, and i could have explained it that would have been a better option where yeah? you complement with all these information you complement your narration has a lot of impact on the message that you're going to be delivered and you need not to talk what is in the slide and that is a waste of information uh, sorry waste of capacity the cognitive capacity of the participants right it may be easier for us just reading it but it's a waste of the cognitive capacity of the participants the spatial congruity is another important principle as you can see the picture a and the picture b when you look at it which picture do you think is easily comprehensible for a student you can just type a or b a yes somebody said a others so at the moment a and b is 50 50 a b so now we are getting more b's let's see few more a b okay somebody who said a can i ask why you say a instead of b uh, so it's easy to identify with the with the numbers okay. just the number uh, is, what is what is the process of identifying a particular part of the skull for a student they have to first look at the number mm -hmm. and then, then they have to go to the list then they have to browse to the particular number and identify the part and they have to match it again with the image image in image b the process is straightforward you look at the image you see the name you look at the image you see the name right so this is a way of actually minimizing the um, workload that someone has to do in order to gather that particular information so in fact b is more you know according to the principle of the spatial contiguity than uh, a but however i you know in some instances when there's a lot of information you might use the other way around but again lot of information is not a good thing and therefore it's basically easier to label content closer to what how it appears in a you know slide show a powerpoint such as this so thank you very much for that uh, input actually then there is a thing called temporal contiguity also this was spatial contiguity temporal contiguity is next this basically tells if we overlay the narrations along with other material like the images and text it's better than presenting the narration after a particular other input like i show the table first or image first and then in the next slide if i talk about that 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 doesn't add value right uh, we learn better if these are presented together right and sometimes you might think okay presenting together will be use up working memory more than you know presenting it next right i mean that probably would have been the logical thing to think of but it is not necessarily the case because these are relevant the two channels don't really um, compete with each other they complement each other and therefore i'm i'm talking about the visual and the auditory inputs they complement each other and they create a better understanding to the learner than presenting it um, at different points in time so that is temporal contiguity uh, principle then the segmenting principle this we all know rather than teaching a complex task in one go it's best to segment it into smaller tasks right that's what we see here the image you know you first have to 
need to know how to juggle a single ball and then two balls and then three balls and so on. That's how the complexity builds up and that's what we, we tend to do. So that's how people learn better. And therefore, that's why we say that even if you're doing now this session from nine to 12, do not. That's why there are three people breaking it at least to create a segmentation of the learning. And this is also why that I initially, you know, mentioned a little bit about the PowerPoint and what the slides are, how to put a slide and that sort of a thing, just to build that basic understanding so that we can build on that. So this is again linked to that. Complexity can be chunked off and you can present it in the same way. Pre-training principle again in the same lines, but this is to say that, okay, it's better to have a foundation knowledge before you teach an additional content. So this is why. If you are a teacher who has already taught, it may be easier for you to understand these principles than somebody who has just come for teaching who had not done previously any teaching activities, right? So pre-training principle, even in the PowerPoint slide presentation or instructional material when you're developing, it's good to talk a little bit about the background, about the basics and so on, before going into a uh, particular uh, segment. You see that in documentaries, if you look at discovery, you know, national science, you know, science everything, they start off with the basics. They describe the basic stuff. They don't go into the complex stuff first. Gradually, they build up and you end up with a whole picture of the whole thing. So this is pre-training that is, that is important. Modality principle, again, talks about the two channels or the two inputs, the visual and the spoken, uh, uh, spoken words. And it says humans learn best from visuals and spoken words then uh, visual and printed. Why is that? Why do you think that is the case? Anyone? Most of them are auditory learners. Uh, most of them are auditory, main, not necessarily, not necessarily. Others? Yes, somebody said the two senses activity. That is exactly true. Because when you say visual and spoken words, visual is eyes, spoken words, yes. If it is visuals and printed words, it goes through the same channel, the visual, right? Eyes. So therefore, you tend to you know, separate it. And that complements rather than... Uh, overloading things in one modality. And that's the importance of a narration also, isn't it? Narration will then make use of a different channel which complements rather than having just not uh, just a you know, slide with a lot of text. Narration will add more value to that particular presentation. Um, then the multimedia principle uh, talks us about the importance of pictures, right? Uh, you may have noticed during the COVID-19, some of the most widely circulated uh, uh, messages from these uh, WHO, CDC and other organizations, even in Sri Lanka, the Health Promotion Bureau and so on, are infographs, right? Infographs are like giving a particular message in a very concise way using pictures or images. And that has more impact in terms of learning or conveying a message than text alone, right? So there are, you know, texts that are very lengthy talking about the, you know, how the disease spreads and so on. People may have not even read, but an infograph at a glance, if you see it, that is having more impact than, uh, that, uh, than the text alone. So, uh, so it, is, it is true for our students also. So in a multimedia learning, that is why it's called multimedia also. You use whatever the images, text, uh, videos, animations, and so on together to complement, and that for the, that will have more impact. Personalization principle again talks about how you present things. Now, the example that I usually give is modern day uh, radio stations, right? Uh, olden days, if you listen to you know radio stations, you will uh, you will hear something like you know. Um, uh, uh, 
this song is for our listeners, right? If I may say it in single, it will say, uh, may gee there, abe asanan vetar. That's what you will hear, right? But in the modern day, what do you hear when you are when you are getting a getting a song? What will the announcers say? In modern day announcers, especially in the private um, uh, radio channels and all. So the so the girl is answering me, or <laughs> she's singing. <laughs> Can anyone ask, have you listened to the radio recently? What do they say when they offer a song? You can say in singular if you wish. You see the chat. Customized to a particular pe people to an extent. Mention the name, okay. Closer. But in single is, I will tell. Uh, you may hear me sindu oyata. Now imagine a person listening to that channel alone in a faraway place. When somebody said me sindu oyata, what do they feel? As if it's being presented to you, it's it's personal. Sense of, sense of right? belongingness or personal sense of belongingness, and that's the way that we develop our instructional material for our students. What you see here is more formal, right? Making a video, developers. So what Dr. Roshan has said, I have put into list saying, this is how you make a video. Develop a storyboard, identify actors, rehearse the video production, record, edit, publish. That's the formal way of presenting it. That is okay to be in the slide. But as the narrator, I won't follow the formal thing. I would say, uh, if you are developing a video first, you have to develop a storyboard that will allow you to identify who are the actors. Now, as soon as I put the first person narrative, that is you, then it kind of becomes personalized. So the, the whole material or the instructional material that you develop for online, it's best for a, a person to have it in a conversation voice or informal voice uh, in order to convey that message because personalization makes humans learn better, right? So that's an important principle. Then if you go to a voice principle, now we have heard now in some of these uh, narrations, we hear a you know, robotic voice. People tend to use the narration to translate and for, for the designers, that seems to be an okay thing, but it is not. People are more fond of human voice than a computer generated voice and therefore voice principle is an important thing. So we as educators or learn, teachers, we have to develop this skill. It's a skill that we need to have. And of course, people have when they do your, you know, uh, live sessions in the classroom and all, but now we have to develop it in order to develop your instructional material. And that's an essential skill for any teacher. The image principle again talks about you know, these modern videos that you see where you have a talking head. Now, talking head is like if I come in full screen and now also I, I'm there, but I have a slide. In the videos, you see, a, you know, a person standing up or closer to the screen talking about it. You see the person more than the slide or uh, that content. It looks good. It looks uh, more personal because there's a person talking and so on. But statistically, that has not shown to have any significant impact on learning. So the talking head um, uh, does not mean people learn better, right? So it's not essential for you to have your, you know, talking head means your, you know, head, you know, appearance in the in the slide. It's not uh, essential because it probably not have much of an effect anyway. So if you can on and off. Um, uh, uh, you know, appear, even if not, it doesn't matter. But narration is important because you're tapping into the different channel. And if you can manage that, that probably will be good enough in terms of developing content. Right, so these are basic uh, things that I have to, you know, in regard to the uh, principles of uh, uh, instructional design or slide-based instructional design that I wanted to talk about. 
Is there any question? Are there any questions? You can post this into the chat uh, uh, any other questions even because we have now come to the end of the session and we are time is also uh, is ending we have few minutes more so if you have any questions any clarifications you want to make please do post it into the chat i think prof Mar singh and dr Roshan are also there uh, we are open for any questions Um, Dr. Roshan, Prof. Marasi, do you want to add anything to the discussion? Dr. Roshan? Uh, Roshan, I think there was a question that asked, uh, uh, okay, there's a question, do we need to write a storyboard to PowerPoint also? Um, if you are developing a video, it may be a better thing to do uh, because, um, uh, because that will help you avoid any errors or you know, save time in terms of development. It's not essential for all presentations, but it will be, um, uh, be uh, useful for you to design a storyboard if you are developing a video as such. But if you are just presenting it, better to write the narration at least, because I showed you that uh, uh, notes page in PowerPoint. Uh, uh, the first thing I showed you was there is a space where you can add a notes page. That is a place where you can actually use to talk about what you will be you know, speaking out. And if you have done these uh, online courses like Coursera and all, Along with the video, you see the full narration of the speaker's, um, you know, text okay, or the full text of the narration rather. And that's helpful for some students, right? Some students may be with hearing difficulties or uh, students who are having various conditions where, you know, they're, they're having difficulty in comprehending the audio uh, or even for certain learners who are strong visual learners they learn best when they see the narration. So in, uh, in some of the modern uh, instructional design tools, you both put the video as well as the speaker's narration side by side. So anyone who wants to follow the narration can follow the narration. Um, uh, so that is an important thing rather than the storyboard uh, from a PowerPoint or slide-based presentation point of view. Hope that answered the, the question. Uh, then there was uh, um, somebody is asking, will this information be suitable for mobile health application development also? I think so. Uh, Roshan, what do you think, Prof. Marasin? Health education, I think, can also use these principles. Uh, yes, Pandra, I think, yes, um, when it comes to, yes, sir, you can present. Yeah, yeah uh, actually, that's why I think uh, with this mobile uh, mobile based capturing and uh, uh, the mobile presentations, uh, even both LMS and YouTube uh, allows a lot of uh, 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 the mobile based uh, content delivery as well. Now, that's where uh, one area uh, uh, this entire uh, content business is moving into because uh, more and more mobile devices are being used, especially now in. Uh, with this pandemic situation and also uh, mobile is closer to the user um, uh, it's a i mean a device which always carried with and so even with a small break they can access the material and so um, even that's good for a working adult uh, i think uh, mobile is uh, very good and uh, delivering the mobile based content to even uh, as a health message to the general, general public uh, mobile would be uh, 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 media which has higher reach so that uh, would be yes. better Prof. yes of course yes uh, this is a very very good question and has been asking for years and years 
Yes, the evidences are now coming because mobile device uh, is portable. That's the one of the main advantage. However, uh, it had the issue of uh, limited screen size. So that also has been now addressed by supporting in different screens. And also it had the issue of uh, connectivity uh, in terms of processing power. That also been as addressed by cloud computing. And with all these things, uh, the, the differences between other modes and mobile modes getting blurred. Now it shows that uh, more and more uh, principles are merging together. Uh, there, there will be no sort of a differences between uh, desktop computer and the mobile. However, having said that, mobile being in Sri Lanka is vastly growing one, and especially when you are delivering health message, uh, it recalls me my PhD. Uh, I designed it's a, it's a delivering health messages to mobile phone in 2010, assuming that mobile will come into place in future in Sri Lanka. So that is happen, happening and that already happened. In education also, that is so. So therefore, uh, however, to uh, counteract with some limitations, what they have, uh, software developers has done this, is that there are two versions usually, mobile version and web version. When you are saving your presentation, you need to be a little mindful uh, about this task because uh, sometimes there are sort of uh, applications which it's not. Sometimes if you develop web based, it might not appear as in the uh, mobile platform, mobile platform, which has a little difference. So technically that is so. However, having said that these principles, it's uh, we have discussed a lot of about principles today and uh, people have interested in asking some principles uh, uh, why it is not uh, available in Sri Lanka. It is not available in Sri Lanka because we are not using it. So that's my simple answer because if we are using it, uh, it will be available. So we are the people actually uh, has to take these new new innovations and test it on us. And then if elevation we can continue, uh, we can uh, remove that. So to do that, we need to develop kind of a culture. That is why we usually encourage to have a evidence-based culture. Uh, so when you are developing evidences, one of the research strategy you can apply is uh, action research. So action research make you to generate uh, evidences while you are working and based on that you can take decisions. So uh, so this kind of uh, movements we need to go on. I think, uh, I don't know whether I have an answer to your question or yeah, I no, have I think, uh, more. Yeah, no, I think those are very useful comments, uh, uh, especially because now when we develop a PowerPoint or a presentation, what we mostly see is that we give more focus on things that uh, to the, you know, even in, in, when I talked about this talking head, we give priority to the person standing in front rather than the, you know, this visual um, slide that may be, uh, uh, may be contributing to the learning. What happens is when you use mobiles, the screen is smaller and therefore the, you know, when the large part of the screen is used up by the talking head or the person, you know, the information that really complements to the learning or the diagrams or the images that may be useful appears as a smaller section of that screen. In a mobile, it will be very much smaller. In a computer, it may be good. Many of our learners use mobiles and uh, not necessarily the computers to access the LMS even. So it's a very important area for us to think when we design instructional material, both for health promotion, health education, as well as for teaching, that it fits mobile as well. And that's very, that is why, uh, you know, if you saw the last uh, presentation, I deliberately kept a lot of white spaces as well as very limited amount of content. And because in a mobile also, that will clearly appear and that's going to, you know, contribute back because the narrator can then do the job of giving that information, additional information that you cannot have in that slide. Um, so I think it's very relevant and it's good inputs that you're bringing in. Thank uh, you very much, Pandula, for that compliment. I think uh, we are closing our time. Yes. Hassan, anything you want to add uh, uh, before we are ending up? 
I think Prof. Asel. Yes. yes. Uh, Before that, you. I will I will I will give a small uh, message. So, one small thing I need to give. We have given a lot of knowledge now. I think knowledge without practice is useless. So, however, having said that, practice without knowledge is dangerous. So I think uh, what we have done is we have tried to give you knowledge. So when you are practicing, you can use it. And when you are using the knowledge, it won't become dangerous. So, so that is a message I want to give. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you very much, Prof. Zamar Singha uh, and Dr. Panula and Dr. Roshan for this very uh, informative uh, session. Although we couldn't run it as a uh, workshop per se, I think there was a lot of engagement and interaction and uh, there were the participants used the chat function very well and there, uh, there were fantastic demonstrations. So I'm sure you should be able to apply uh, all this knowledge uh, in practice in the future, uh, near future. So once again, my heartiest thanks to all the resource persons and to all the participants today. And uh, for the participants, uh, of course, I hope that all of you would join us for the main conference of the Colombo uh, Conferencing Medical Education on the 19th and 20th of this month. So with that, uh, we'll uh, wind up uh, this session. Thank you again for everyone and have Thank a good you. day. Thank you, everyone. See you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Roshan. Thanks, Pandit. Thanks, sir. Thank Thanks, Asil.